please stand for the pledge. Hi, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Hi, everybody, and welcome tonight. Um, we have a lot on the agenda, so we will try to keep tonight move, moving. Uh, so before we do any public input and announcements, can, uh, there are a few things that are being added to the agenda. Um, the UPSU contract was ratified by the employees that it represents two days ago at 12 o'clock, and so the memorandum of agreement was signed by myself and by Stacy, who represents the um, UPSU union, so I'd like tonight to get ratification by the board so we can enter into that contract. I have also added on um, a municipal, some municipal training and oversight for the new bookkeeper that I will talk to. Then there was also, which right now I really would prefer not to do it, but if we have time um, to look at it, we'll do it. There's an intermissible agreement for police services with the New Paltz Center School District. And even though the contract has not changed from year to year to year, I think that it really behooves us to look at contracts. And just because it's been done the same way year after year doesn't make it necessarily right. It doesn't mean we might not want to change things. And so my preference would be for the town board to have time to look at it before we put it on the agenda. However, the chief said if we did have time because the school district might need to use the services of the police before our next meeting, that you know we might want to take a look at it. But um, my preference would be not to, but we'll see how the night goes and if we have time for everybody to read it. And if there's a chance that the school district needs to use extra police, we'll try to figure out how to, how to deal with that. But we can do that a little bit later. But I really think we just can't say, because it's been done before, we just ratify it and move on. We have to start really looking at what we've been agreeing to that's uh, in contracts. And also, um, Dave and I are going to have a um, pretty, I think, very exciting update on the status of where we've been going with the town water system and all the work that we've been doing and how we're going to move forward. And uh, so we're going to be adding that to the agenda. So if there's nothing else, can I have a motion to accept the agenda as amended? So moved. Can I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion so carried. Well, I guess everybody voted aye. Aye. Gene? <laughs> aye. Okay, motion yes. so carried. I just carried the motion before you all voted. That's all. Okay, um, time for public input. If anybody would like to speak, what we ask is that you come up, identify yourself, and speak into the microphone so it gets captured on television. And if the video recorder could ever go over by the, by the microphone, so this way it's heard on TV. I'm sorry, what? All right. We want the district attorney to investigate these 164 allegations of star exempted fraud and revolts. I think everybody over there has a copy of it. True or false? That everybody has a copy? Is that the true or false? Huh? Is it true or false that everybody has a copy? Yeah. We, we don't have a copy of the allegation, but we okay. have a list of uh, star exemptions. I think you can copy this and make some more of them. So you are alleging that there are 164 Frauds. cases of star exemptions. Frauds. Frauds. <laughs> and I have to be one of these people paying too much taxes in New Paltz to get the truth. Okay. okay. Thanks. Anybody else would like to speak during public input? Please go up to the microphone and identify yourself. Oh, Christ. It's hard to tell. My name is uh, Paul Brown. I live in the town of New Paltz. I uh, rise to speak at this public comment to thank uh, Councilperson Key Brown for her courage and her leadership. And, uh, leading the board to uh, ask some honest questions and hopefully get some honest answers with regard to the major application before the planning board. Um, I think some public officials have overstepped their bounds in trying to meddle in planning board activities, but in this case, um, the town has a responsibility to look at the increasingly weird 
application for uh, by Wilmerite Incorporated for a fifty million dollar rental project as a for profit company asking to pay no taxes. And this is a project in my forty four years <coughs> in town that is growing weirder and weirder by the moment. Um, there are far too many good questions in search of answers. And for the first time in many years I've observed and sat through uh, planning board meetings and then served on the planning board and was chairman of the planning board, I've never seen um, an arrogance on the part of the applicants where they would intimidate some planning board members or seek to, I don't think they succeeded, and tell them what not to ask and when not to ask it and how not to ask. Their role is to answer questions and to go through the seeker uh, process. I think Councilman Brown is on to something because we need face-to-face -face honest discussions. And we've had several new members but in the planning board, but they've shown how much they've grown in the past six months and are beginning to ask the right questions. I, um, I know that some of you know this project, when it first appeared, I was the chairman of the planning board, and it morphed into something very different. We had a planned unit development application at the time that the uh, planning board was looking at. It went away to the economics or whatever. But we all learned a lot about the community, and the town board had a significant role in demanding that density of the type that Wilmerite is seeking would require public benefit, like basketball courts, like pools, uh, like tennis courts. The college has been generous, uh, but this is a different case. A for-profit company wants to build something, the density in the town would have been involved directly, not just the planning board. So there's been an end run. Uh, I'm not clear that it's been fully vetted, um, but I trust that it will come out. We must sit down and speak to the applicant who has shown an aloofness recently that again is a little mysterious. Uh, they have this $15 million project, they don't want to pay taxes on it, but they've adopted an approach uh, which could be that you, you don't give us the one the rules we want or play our way, we'll take our ball and go home. They won't go home if this is the profit for them. They can afford a million and a half dollars a year based on the profit they would make on 732 beds. But I think it's important what the town board is doing because for a long while the planning board with inexperienced members was asking Wilmerite, what, what's the answer? And they'd say, well, talk to the college. And the college said, well, this isn't our project. Talk to Wilmerite. And a couple of attorneys came in and tried to intimidate the board. So with your experience stepping in and your authority to ask these questions, you can determine whether the powers you've given to the planning board are being abused by an applicant. Maybe they're not, but we need the experience and maturity of the town board and your expertise, so I welcome what you're doing. And um, I want to say it's not just the planning board. I've had members of the Zoning Board of Appeals tell me that they see, and I've watched it, but they experience on the other side of the table a similar aloofness, which is, Give us our variances, but if you don't, that's all right too. Um, we have other options. So I keep hearing about these options, and I don't know anybody who's really bearing down on that. The planning board has played this full with Seeker. The, the DBA has its own procedures and are always very well run by the chair. Um, but the town board can go where it wants, when it wants, and subpoena who it wants. So I'm delighted to see what you've done, Councilman Brown, and I'm glad the other board members are supporting you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else who would like to speak during public comment? I would please. Um. I would just like to uh, refer what Paul said about Kitty because I listened to her answer things that was thrown at her by the planning board attorney, and she was the only one who question, but that doesn't make any sense. But that doesn't make any sense. I don't know the whole point, but at least she was not. Just letting it go by. Um, I just wanted to bring something to the uh, board's attention. It's not important, it's just something I want to make you aware of. At the last meeting, the uh, head of your um, public access committee uh, relayed to you and the public uh, what he, the information he got from Time Warner regarding their discontinuance of Channel 23 to a certain segment of the population. 
Um, I did some checking into it, and in my own opinion, according to the way like Tom Water likes to do things, yes, this piece of equipment that you need is free, but it's only free for a little over a year. After that, you'll be paying anywhere from $14 to $16 a month for the privilege of using this equipment to get Channel 23. And I just think that's typical of the way they do, just like they raise the franchise fee in the village. Uh, I asked them how come, and they said, well, the village told us to raise your franchise fee. Check with the village, and nobody has any notion. And nobody's going to go sue them or anything else for 90 cents a month. It's just the idea that, you know, they, they say what they want, they pay to say what they want, they pay to do what they want. And I just wanted the you know, town board to be aware that this is just more nonsense that they're doing. Get it over as far as we're concerned on to the town residents. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. Is there anybody else? Anybody else who would like to speak during public comment? Okay, with that, then we'll get into announcements. So uh, let me get to the announcements. First, I just want to remind everybody that this weekend, I think it's this weekend, yep, Saturday, July 27th, from 1 to 7 o'clock at Hasbrook Park, New Paltz, again, is Perseverance Field Day, which is a young woman in our community who's trying to help uh, children with, uh, in foster care have better lives and be able to go through the trauma that they go through and not do it alone. It's a great program all day long from 1 to 7. It'll be a field day, kickball, live music, face painting, baby rest booth, Jim Perry magic, basketball tournament, local food vendors, balloon animals, and a reading tent. And they need volunteers to go and help, And uh, but it's to help um, foster brothers and sisters succeed. So anybody who could go there tomorrow, please go and show your support. Um, also, if I told you the other um, last week that I had been up in Albany for um, the Governor Cuomo's uh, presentation for Building Back Better, New York Rising Storm Recovery, which was a conference providing details on the New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program, explored innovative recovery options with resilience planning experts, and got inspired by what others around the country who are facing similar ch challenges have achieved. And as I said, the town of New Paltz will be um, eligible for $3 million the village of New Pulse is eligible for $3 million. If we work cooperatively, we're eligible for even more than the $6 million. And so if anybody, we're going to be getting updates uh, in the next couple of weeks. The state is still vetting it all out. They're going to be coming down and talking to us. But if anybody does want to learn a little bit more about this, there is um, uh, information on a website, which is ATTP NY Sandy Help dot new york dot gov slash community reconstruction dash program http slash slash nysandy help dot new york dot gov slash community reconstruction slash program and um, there is a video on there about uh, the New York recovery effort and I will just say it's a really wonderful video that's very uplifting because what it does is it shows other communities whether it was San Francisco after the earthquake or other places after the flood and what other communities have done to actually take a disaster and turn it into a benefit for the community and when you see what these other communities have done it's really, really impressive, and that's what New York State is looking for, is for us not to just go in and fix the same old problem, but to come up with solutions that go towards the future and show the resilience. And, you know, and um, we are going to have to put together a committee. There's a structure. There are going to be members of the public that we need to have serving on this committee. So we will be reporting back because it's an amazing opportunity, and it would be great if we can come together as a community and really take advantage of it. So I just wanted to share that with you, and I'll just give this to you, um, okay. Also, um, what, there was another, oh, okay, yes, the town website. So as you know, last week we all, uh, we launched the new website. We had commented that it was a work in progress, that there was still a lot of work to do, that a lot of the department heads had not had the chance to yet upload their stuff, and so there were blank pages, but the department heads have been working very, very, very hard to get their pages loaded. Um, it's, I really, again, and I know I've said this a thousand times, but I really have to thank Carol Connolly because she's been working tirelessly, tirelessly. Um, she's been here like to late o'clock at night working Saturdays and Sundays to get this up and operational and loading documentation. Yesterday she had the biggest smile on her face because within an hour she must have loaded so many documents just like this and couldn't believe how easy it is. So we've got town codes up there, we have town laws up there. We actually have all the documents that we are discussing tonight 
is on the town website. And so that is, we had to do that had to be in compliance with the new law that was put in place last year. We couldn't do it because our website was not web friendly enough for us to do it. But in one week with having our new website up, Carol was able to load all of tonight's documents onto the website. We got something just about two hours ago from our um, auditor to help us with our bookkeeper. I got it. Carol was able to upload it immediately so anybody watching can go to the website and actually see what we're talking about. Also, you also, if you're here in Town Hall, Kitty Brown, and you want to go online yes. with Wi-Fi, yes. the Wi-Fi is in place, and there is a code to get on. Right. The only reason we're not giving it out publicly is because we don't want a lot of people showing up in our parking lot using sitting outside using our Wi-Fi. So while we try to use it and get on it, we get overloaded. But anybody who comes to Town Hall can go to our office, to the clerk's office, can get the password, um, and you could get Wi-Fi right now. It works now in tandem with our new website, and so that's very, very exciting. And you can actually log on to it tonight during the meeting, bring up any of the um, documents that we're talking about as we talk about them and follow along with us. So we're complying with open meetings, Bill, and you had asked us about this last year, and I said we couldn't do it because of the website. We got our new website, and within one week, we're in compliance. So it's very, very exciting, and I know that we have, we, I, think our open I think our open space plan just got loaded today. I know that I think our floodplain law, our wetland law, I think they've all gotten gotten loaded. So it's uh, if there's a document that we have in town hall, it will be on the website. So that's very, very exciting. So I wanted to do that little quick update. Um, yes, open space and the current master plan. And they're listed under the building department if you want to go find them. Um, and I'm so. Good. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh You've seen it first. Do a close up on Kitty Brown's face <laughs> and stuff. So she is now on and stuff. And you can follow along, Kitty, without looking at this. I, I, and I then, could go home. Yes, you can. And vote, right, we can all go home okay. and vote via whatever. Also, what this will do is you know, we are a zero waste community and we generate an awful lot of paper. But now we don't have to necessarily make copies of the packets because right. it's all online and the board members have it right there at their fingertips. So that's very, very exciting and we've accomplished a lot within a week's time and it's only going to get better. So that's really exciting and again, I know Rosanna has been very, very helpful to Carol and working really, really hard also. All the department heads are trying to do the hardest that they can. and. Um, if I, you know, Carol's just constantly like on the website loading stuff, so it's it's really it's a great accomplishment. So I don't know if any other board members. I know that there's something tomorrow, right? For no Saturday, Saturday. there's also the um, Climate Action Coalition right. is doing an event at. Uh, it's going to be. Um, Saturday at 11 o'clock, uh, Main Street New Paltz is a thank you rally, thanking Governor Cuomo for not allowing fracking to occur thus far. Um, and it's being organized by Ann Gunther and Roz Cherry and Dan Gunther and all the wonderful people who've been working on this issue for so long. And if you really want to get inspired to um, look at how long uh, New Paltz has been uh, trying to bring public awareness to the problem of fracking, you can go to uh, a little public service announcement that was actually produced by Susan Zimmett before she came back to be our town supervisor. And it's called My Hero, New York Water Rangers. And it stars Adam Lefevre, who lives about five minutes from here. He's and hilarious. it's really wonderful. It, it's, it's a wonderful video. So you can go to My Hero, New York Water Rangers. It was probably made three years ago. We actually did that commercial at the beginning of last year's session when Governor Cuomo last year was going to be doing his State of the State. We wanted to make sure that he actually didn't really talk about fracking in the state of the state. So we broke that commercial the night before the state of the state. It broke right before the Liz Benjamin show. It got a... <laughs> He's just so adorable. Adam Lefevre. Can you make it louder? No, I want people to watch it. But it's Adam Lefevre in his Superman outfit. And uh, there he is, folks. <laughs> Actually, well, actually, with this particular commercial, okay. we um, did this at Minnewaska, and at the very end of the commercial, what you'll see is um, this is a lot, a lot of work. But this it's guy, uh, I, you would not want to send your kid out on Halloween in this costume. That's all I can tell you. Well, Adam, 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 Adam is a Newport's resident.
it. <laughs> well, actually, Water Rangers had a has a um, campaign called Water Rangers, and they show kids like, you know, you can be a water ranger, you can be a hero and protect the water, and they have a cape on. So what we did was we sort of took it and personified it and made him like Superman in a way. And what we know is with Governor Cuomo, it's better when you compliment him. And so we were basically saying to him that you can be our hero, and we uh, did it at Minnewaska. But the very interesting thing is at the very end, what you see is character generated actual wells from Pennsylvania, character generated on the ridge of Mohonk, of Minnewaska. So it gives you a sense when it pulls back if we ended up doing fracking with wells, what that could look like and what the industrialization of the state would be. Um, but actually, if that commercial's not on, but if there's another commercial, if you also go to YouTube um, and you do um, um, I Love My New York Water and Slash Ethan Hawk. There was a commercial we did three years ago about I Love My New York Water, but we recently redid that commercial and did it again this year um, at the beginning of the State of the State, which basically said to Governor Cuomo, thank you, Governor Cuomo, for um, basically not doing fracking and protecting New York. Now it's time to reaffirm your commitment. So we actually have three commercials on fracking, I Love My New York Water one, Water Rangers, and then another I Love My New York Water commercial. And then we did a tourism commercial about how beautiful tour New York is and about, um, you know, we all love New York, and then if we bring fracking in, how it industrializes New York, and then goes back to, we know you love New York, Governor Cuomo. So we've been trying to make it very easy for him to deny fracking in New York State. <laughs> so, okay. thank you, Kitty, though. Wow. So anyway, and actually, just to make a quick comment, this thing on Saturday is being, is, is actually, it's being held all over the state. So it's really under 350.org which everybody needs to understand, 350.org is when we got to 350 parts per whatever, you know, in our temperature. We're starting a downhill trend in terms of climate change. Yeah. We're at 400 now. Parts per million of parts, carbon. Right, right, okay, so, but we're now at 400. We're already at 400, we broke 350. When we get to 450 in 20 years, we're all can say goodbye. But, um, for, so 350.org is hosting this all over the state, and organizations all over the state are hosting things in their local community. And so New Pulse is one of the many communities participating throughout the state on trying to raise the caliber of climate change conversation and why fracking is not the answer. And so please come out and support a very important cause. Jeff, anybody else? Nothing? Another thing okay. I had was uh, the follow up also on Mr. Brown's comments is uh, the town board was going to all try to attend, not try, we were all scheduled, scheduled to, attend to attend the July IDA meeting. Uh, they canceled it, I believe, with about 48 hours notice. Less. Less. less probably less. about. <laughs> Right. It, it, they canceled it with so little notice that we were all ready to carpool. We were we were <laughs> we were ready to go. Uh, it has been rescheduled for August 14th at 8 a.m. So I would encourage anyone interested in the community in the project of Park Point uh, or in the possible consequences of having it being developed and not paying taxes to attend the August 14th, 2013 meeting. It's up, and Susan, could you, it's in something library. Oh, it's in the Karen Binder Library, which, which is, is um, it's on the sixth floor of the county legislature. When you get off the elevator, you go to the, well, you can go to the right or the left. You can go through the legislature or the executive's offices, but it was a legislative, it was a legislative, uh, Office, uh, legislative conference room when Karen Binder, our clerk, died of cancer a few years ago. It got renamed the Karen Binder Library. But it's the library on the sixth floor that uh, across from where the legislative chambers are. And so it's there. So I, I think as many of us are going to try to attend. I Right at this moment, I need to, I mean, uh, you guys can all look, but I have to redo a work schedule, but I'm going to try to attend. I, the last one I had was able with a little bit more notice. So again, I believe we're all going to try to attend that one at AAM and make our comments to the IDA about this project. Again, so that's August 14th at 8 a.m. in the sixth floor of the building. And the other one not to miss coming up, uh, it opens uh, July 30th, is the Ulster County Fair. Uh, if anyone can't find that, just look for which way the cars are heading and you will find it. And that goes uh, from the 30th to the 4th. And the opening day is the uh, car load day and they charge you Anyone by know? The car load. By the car load. Anyone know what the rate is this year? No. And it's also free for seniors. You got to use it. Uh, is that basically? I, 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 you know, you can go to their website, and the county will tell you what the special yeah. days are. But that does open up uh, August. Thir uh, excuse me, July 30th, and runs through August 4th at the county fairgrounds. 
Okay, okay so is that it? All right, I would just August, add that. August 14th at 8 a.m. I will not be able to attend. I've already scheduled. So. Oh, okay. Just one unit. So. Okay, right. thanks. So I just read today that March Gallagher is no longer the economic development coordinator. You're, be, you're behind the, that was news three, two weeks ago. Okay, <laughs> I read it today. <laughs> but the good news is that a local resident, New Paltz resident, Susan, Susan Holt, Holt yes. has been appointed to that uh, mm -hmm. position. So I think we'll have a good local ear mm -hmm. to hear our concerns. Well, uh, uh, Susanna Holt is uh, yeah. was, she was a deputy um, deputy um, okay. well she was she actually worked she, she actually worked in um, um, in um, the county attorney's office and she uh, worked uh, for B but she just got moved into this position um, I will say March Gallagher was very 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 um, very what's the word receptive she very what's the word I'm trying to think she, yeah, she helped us a lot. Marge Gallagher very cared very much about what was going on. Marge Gallagher was the one who got in touch with me to let me know that we could actually, in the negotiations with um, Park Point, in, even though that there was that 450 to 750 range, that we could go beyond that and ask for more money. To you know, and she was the one who alerted me to that. And so she was very, very, very helpful to us anyway. But yes, we welcome Susanna Holt, who's a New Paltz resident, to that new position. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so we have a lot of people here that are guests tonight because of what's on the agenda. So I'd like to start with the C's asset and invite Joey um, to join us, our chief. And I, you know, Jeff, you had brought up at the last meeting um, that you had written to the chief and hadn't gotten a response. So I just want to put into the minutes um, uh, just so we can just have clear whatever. But um, I did write to the supervisor, uh, to the chief after the meeting asking him to respond. No, I did, and I, I responded back to all already on that. Yeah, yeah. it was no, no, I know. in a flurry of emails. Okay, yes. so I just want for the record to show because of the fact that, uh, that he did respond. So I just, good morning, supervisor. You indicated that the board wanted a list of vehicles in our fleet and how they are being used assigned. I did receive a request from Councilman Logan on July 13th, which was Saturday. When I came back into work on Monday, July 15th, I responded to his request. See below. I also also appreciate the invite to attend tonight's board meeting so I may be able to answer any questions or concerns you or other board members may have. I will be there. Thank you again respectfully, Joe Schneider. So I just wanted to, in fairness to the chief, show, set the record straight that he did respond. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I will just give this to you so you have it for the record. Okay, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to the chief to answer any questions that the boards have on the vehicles and how they're used and whether or not this uh, request for seized assets for this car is a, I don't want to say justified because I don't think you would ask if it wasn't justified, but <laughs> it's, it's replacing a, uh, and what I need you to do is um, take it. you turn it around and because it's really important because what we do get just so everybody do, does know. They pretty much hear most of us at the table, except occasionally for Kevin, but whenever somebody sits down here, they don't hear them, and sometimes when the audience speaks, they don't hear them. So we're gonna try to be really conscious to get you to use the microphones so people watching can hear us and people in the audience can hear us. And we also, if you could tilt yourself just a little bit so the camera doesn't just get your back. Yeah, okay, it just will make for, uh, it's better for the audience watching not to see your back. Good evening. Um, yeah, it is a little uncomfortable to have to turn around and see everybody. So unfortunately, that's the setup here. But um, but thank you for having me. Thank you. And um, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to come in and exp explain or answer some questions you may have in regards to the administrative vehicle we're looking to re replace. Um, as you know, we had seized an Audi uh, that was used as administrative vehicle for about four years. Um, some concern came up because the police were driving around an Audi, uh, although it was seized from a drug dealer, uh, and also gave us fifty thousand dollars in the trunk. Um, I, 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 understand, I understand the concern, uh, so it was auctioned off. Uh, the vehicle was auctioned off, uh, I guess, about two months ago now. Uh, what happens with seizures, we don't get the total amount of money. Uh, the DEA does the seizure forfeiture for us. Uh, they take twenty percent off the top. The district attorney's office has to get a percentage because they have to sign off on it. Uh, rather than being seized through the state process, uh, the, the police department does get more funds. So we end up probably with about 60% of the uh, actual amount seized. Uh, what's nice is that if we do use a vehicle or equipment or anything that's seized uh, from a drug dealer, uh, that 
we only have to pay the DEA their percentage of whatever a value would be if we auctioned it off at that time, but we don't have to share the money with the DA's, off, uh, DA's office or anybody else. But technically, if the DEA is involved, why do you have to pay them? Because they are involved with all prosecutions, and it, it's, it's, it's just the, it's the protocol that's set up, because this, if the, DEA, uh, the DA does not sign off on allowing the DEA to do the seizure for us, uh, technically, they are the ones for the state and for our township that would do the seizure. So they have to approve allowing the feds to do it for us. I'm working with all of us, that doesn't sound yeah. Okay, no, well, <laughs> anyway, yeah. okay, let's. <laughs> that's the way it's uh, unfortunately <laughs> done. Um, at any rate, uh, so we, we uh, auctioned the vehicle off. We got $10,500 for that vehicle, uh, which was pretty good, especially after having used it for four years. Um, so now we're looking to replace that vehicle. What we'd like to do in replacing the vehicle is get a, I know you like this one, a hybrid vehicle. Uh, we have not yet ever had a hybrid. We've looked at the cost factor involved. Um, and in the past, we've looked at even our patrol units as hybrids. But because of all the equipment in them, there hasn't been a lot of uh, positive feedback at this point. This is an opportunity for us to get a hybrid vehicle. Uh, we're looking at a Ford Fusion. It's a compact car. Um, and uh, we would use that uh, from the seized account uh, to purchase it. And it would give us a great opportunity to try uh, a hybrid uh, for an administrative vehicle. I think it would be fine. This would be the second vehicle we're looking to purchase it through an auction process. So it's a used vehicle, but yet mileage is low enough that we would get factory warranty on it. Again, like the vehicle I'm driving with. Uh, my vehicle costs just over $10,000. In the past, we've been spending close over $30,000 for administrative vehicles that were brand new. Um, I believe that, yes, the patrols need the newer vehicles because they're constantly going, constantly moving. Uh, for administrators. Constantly being repaired, constantly. Because <laughs> we're all sliding off all the time. Yes. So the, the uh, administrative vehicles, uh, to get a used vehicle with low mileage, we get many years use out of it. I've had mine now, I believe, four years. Um, still only has 70,000 miles on it. That'll probably last longer than me here. Um, so, uh, well, you never know, but, but you know, but it, uh, you know, hopefully the vehicle will, uh, you know, continue to get good use because you only have one operator, which makes a big difference. Um, I can see, honestly, when, when I do a budget or prepare a budget to buy a new vehicle for an administrator uh, car because of how they're used. Um, so this is a perfect opportunity to get a used one. And what better than to use money that we receive from drug dealers to buy them for us. Um, one of the questions that we had last week, because um, you know, because we just authorized sixteen thousand and like about five hundred dollars to buy a bunch of computers for th for the cars, bringing down the seized asset to a certain amount, and then we'll take this money out, leaving sort of not that much left. So one of the concerns was the price that we were being asked to authorize was to buy the car, but then what was brought up was, are we going to have to put computers and lights and other equipment in it that will be an additional cost? So, you know, the question sort of then became, if we do do this, how do we authorize a price that actually potentially, you know, we also understand that, you know, we're, we have to account for the additional costs. So we wanted to get a sense from you of what the real cost you think is going to be, so then we know how much to authorize to um, allow you to go bid, so we find ourselves with money in the account. I understand. That's an excellent question. We're actually using the same equipment that was in the Audi. Uh, the equipment was removed. It's going to cost to reinstall, I believe, about four hundred dollars. Okay. Um, but we're using all the same equipment. Um, the radios are all on lease throughout the department, and the lights and siren and mm -hmm. the type of equipment is what we've had. So there's no additional cost. The cost that I'm requesting also is at the high end. I plan on finding something, hopefully, more close to fifteen rather than the twenty. The reason why I set up to the twenty thousand is because. When you're in a process of doing an auction, I want to have a buffer zone to know that if it goes up a little bit, that we'd be able to still get it. Or we stay so closer to 15. Um, you know, the way the way it works, and looking, and I've been looking at the cars uh, through the auction. They range in price. They're a hybrid. The hybrid makes it a little more money. Just like when we're looking to buy new cars, hybrids are about four thousand dollars more uh, than a regular gas vehicle. It would take you a couple of years to get break even for a new vehicle. Uh, because of what you spend for hybrid compared to what you're paying in gas and where it balances out. 
Um, what I'm looking at is, you know, because we got a Ford Fusion, just a compact car that was right. not hybrid, you can get them for about 12. Looking at the hybrids, again, they're about, with about 20,000, 18,000 miles on them, which are under factory warranty for three years from being put in service and or 36,000 miles. So it's great to get them that way. And sometimes you can also get affordable uh, extended warranties when you buy them when they're still under factory warranty, which again, I'm hoping it's gonna be around 15, maybe another 1,500 to 1,800 for extended warranty and would be in a nice comfortable zone in replacing the car. Okay. So Jeff, um, now I know Jeff, you had some questions about the existing vehicles and how they were used and allocated. I know you met with the chief um, the other day according to an email that you sent out. So I just want to know if you feel comfortable with the information that you received from the chief or you want to share anything or talk about anything before we move forward? No, I, I never met with the chief. But oh, I thought you I did. No, I never met with the chief. No, I never met with the chief. I, Where I just, did you get this information? Because I was kind of confused. Uh, it's all, and if you do go deeper into, as Ira had pointed out, into the monthly reports, you can pull out all of the vehicles. Okay, not, so it's, it's, in the de it's in the detailed one. It's not the one, that, the summary one that we get, but if you go and open up the book, you do, every month you do put it all in there. We just got to go through the list. Okay, I didn't understand what, because what, I saw there was something there about the buying a motorcycle in the future, which is an Oh, no, that, no, that was just something I looked at. I was looking at okay. the, because, uh, and that came up, that's a okay. totally different discussion. No, we're all... We're fine with the motorcycle. It's a different discussion, <laughs> uh, and just because Kevin and I both wondered why there was new striping. Do you want to see the we, bird? From <laughs> yes, and there was new striping <laughs> on it. And <laughs> <laughs> no, we turned the lease in every two years, yeah. so we went back and looked. So it's a, I, we're fine with the motorcycle. Just maybe the motorcycle maybe purchasing it's something to look at. We have looked at that. Yeah, and I, I don't want to so talk I, about that yeah. tonight, this though. But no, we're fine exciting. with it. It just that there was a big bill for it, and then I went in and looked, and you guys had just turn in the lease because it makes the most sense. Okay. It's, it's an actually great program that you've been running. And, and, been very good and I didn't realize the lease price was actually so inexpensive on that. Uh, and then I looked in. gas alone for the miles we put on it. <laughs> oh, God, there's no, that thing gets like, That's there's like $30 one. gas bills a month for that. So the gas on it is uh, great. And also, I guess it must be a state bid lease because it's substantially yes. lower than anything I could find. Correct. And that's why there's uh, there's nothing, no company local that does the state bid on them uh, for lease. Yeah. That's why we've been dealing with the New England. Uh, Which is, I, I didn't even, I you know I didn't even look at that. And also, it looks like the state bid purchase price on it is really attractive. So that's why I was wondering. It may be because at a low mileage we do, but this is again a different discussion. I didn't mean to get into sure. it, but with the low mileage we do, because it's it's idle most of the winter, I wonder if purchasing it is worth it, and then you can make the money on the back end. But that's something that you would know. We, can, we have discussed that and we've looked at that as a possibility. Um, when you think of what the the repairs that go with it, that's what I was getting yeah. up to twenty thousand. Yeah. We turn them in with about twelve thousand miles. Uh, once you get up around the way they're going, around 20,000, it gets very costly to repair them. Um, the, that's why the lease seems to be what yeah. most departments have been doing. Um, yeah. But it's something that we can revisit. No, it's totally your choice, because I, I, the lease price was very, very reasonable. Yes. So that's it. Uh, no, I was just wondering is, and again, it's a discussion, it's why I put an email back to you that uh, I wonder if something you want to discuss with the, uh, I mean, or with the uh, police commission is there's definitely, if you're only using 70,000 miles in four years, do we have an administrative car that we're always going to need or is this going to turn into a car someone will be taking home? We, what we do with our cars, we cycle through them. Uh, the best car as, no, uh, as- And I'm sorry, just this car, so this car, so- This car would be a car for second in command. Um, okay. Whatever you wish, Lieutenant, Detective Sergeant, right. whatever. Um, he has a take-home car. Uh, he responds from home, uh, so that, that's how it's used. It's his vehicle to drive back and forth, uh, to go to meetings, to respond to calls, whatever. It's assigned to him, just like the detective's cars are. Yep. I know you mentioned... Uh, so that would take out then, okay, and, and that does answer a good question. So that takes out in any of the idle, because I, I didn't really quite understand what the administrative car was for. So that would take out the idle patrol cars, because we potentially, the next shift would come in and that car would be somewhere else. Correct. So that would take that out. And then any of the uh, the older cars, like there's an old Taurus and... Uh, yeah, and that's, yeah. I, is, that, is that the one that we see sitting there and it looks 
old? Very old. <laughs> the Taurus. Yeah, the Taurus is very old. That looks very old. Okay. That yeah. has over 100,000 miles. Yeah. The, the air conditioning doesn't work. Um, that was a detective car from 2001. It's uh, 12 years old, going on 13. Time to and, trade that. Well, the thing is that we use it for, again, you know, rather than replacing cars, mm -hmm. uh, that car doesn't get used a lot. It's considered a car that we use for certain details. Mm -hmm. um, if we have somebody assigned assisting detectives, they'll use it. If they go to uh, the DA's office for, uh, for a hearing or whatever, mm -hmm. they'll take one of those cars. Okay. Um, the old 340 was an old Mark car that we mm -hmm. bought. We used it out of the lease continue to use it in patrol until the miles got up there a little bit more and we started having some problems. We strip it down, we use it. Sometimes we give cars to the town, the clerk's office. Um, you know, so we continue to use them in the town. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it for when the officers go to school so they don't take a marked car going to school um, because they're in plain clothes, so you don't want them in a marked car. You know, so the way, the way the cycling of the cars, we get the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, to really get the use of the car until we can't use them anymore. I know I've been talking with Chris Marks about uh, some of the vehicles that they use that used to be old cars that now are beginning to be a headache, um, some more major mechanical. Um, so potentially uh, one of our old cars or maybe two of our old cars may come out to be used for the town, uh, for, for the, the highway department, okay. or again, for somebody else that may need it. I, I only have... Or, or yeah. our clerk that let me sit by her. <laughs> I, I guess the only one is the other yes. car is the, the uh, Charger, but that's fully marked. So, and also I, we would have to talk to the PBA because that's partially. The PBA was purchased uh, right. through money funds. That was, uh, I forget the center and I, and I apologize. That's, no, that's fine. Uh, I, I know it wasn't but, our money. Correct. So. It, it was donated to the uh, PBA uh, the, for the purchase of a car. Um, that was agreed and agreed that the town would maintain it. We'd be able to, we do use it, um, not only for special details, but when a sergeant's car is out or uh, the officer's assigned car. Again, I know you, you questioned about the number of cars, how they're used. Uh, when cars go in for service, they use a different car. It's not for repairs. No, I, it all, like I said, all the numbers, like I said, as I sent you an email, all the numbers make sense. Okay. Uh, and the only one that didn't, because I didn't know exactly what the use was, but since the use could potentially have it being called out in the middle of the night that if they went it takes all the patrol cars out the one two it takes the six patrol cars out of the rotation because they are needed right so then that kind of just leaves the other one so unless we can talk the administrative person into uh using an unmarked bicycle uh, <laughs> it looks like i'll take the motorcycle home. i wouldn't mind the motorcycle uh, i'm sorry i'm only for the bicycle i'm sorry well, i'll tell you in february if you want to use the motorcycle then you come know, and see us officers that ride the motorcycle uh, but that's why i put in there right through up until yeah. they were the, yeah. they're, they're on a little time yeah. and, so, so, and, and that's why i put that comment so in there I'm is that yeah two officers use about. i know we have a lot to go over tonight so so joe i'm actually very good because now that that explains but the patrol cars were my were the ones i was looking at and okay. also okay. Susan just made the comment though about the repair vehicles uh, actually a few years ago uh, I, you made a I know a large change in education and it has paid off uh, when I first came on the board we were seeing a lot more dings and bangs and uh, you know and uh, complete totals and unfortunately there have been a few very serious accidents but uh, for vehicles that see the incredible amount of mileage they are absolutely going to happen in the most recent ones it was actually with a deer so I, that's it's an unavoidable accident so actually Joe has done and predating uses and Joe has done an incredible job of reducing the repair bills uh, the bills you sign off on are actually just maintenance six hundred dollars a month yeah ma ma maintenance <laughs> but it, it's, it, it's all plain maintenance on very high mileage so vehicles so no Joe you have done a, I, a great job I also just want to add that um, Chief Snyder has been very receptive to my barrage of emails <laughs> about other police departments that are using hybrids and um, just one of the things that if you can rotate it in it just you know, breaks my heart to drive down Main Street and see the patrol cars idling and spewing out all those 400 parts per million. Um, so, you know, if in your research you feel that it would be appropriate to use the hybrid as one of those idling vehicles, um, 
I would just be thrilled if that I works for you. I the department that's using it in patrol. Okay. And if it's holding up the ability to run all the electronic equipment, right. I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, don't leave yet. Um, so can I have a uh, motion? Uh, for I make a motion authorizing a transfer of C's assets funds up to $20,000 to cover the cost of this hybrid vehicle that the chief needs. Do I have a second, Kitty? Second. <laughs> Does anybody want to discuss? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion so carried. Go to the auction, have fun. Before you leave, though, um, we'll, let's just get to the towing law. Uh, oh. We did have a public hearing last week yeah. on the towing law, and it's funny that you're here tonight. Uh, so you came, you complained, we, we heard, we listened, we acted, and tonight we're going to hopefully approve an ad addition to the towing law, and maybe we'll name it in your honor. Okay? <laughs> so um, basically the change that did get made would be um, we added all towing business must have have a secure indoor and outdoor storage area within the town of New Paltz available in which to store specified vehicles out of public access and staff with a registered repair shop employee present at least on weekdays between 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. authorized to release tow vehicles to the claimants. So, um, and then did we add the thing in about the mechanics? Yes, did. Okay, and so we also add all towing companies must make their facilities, this was in it, all towing companies must make their facilities and equipment available for scheduled inspection. Inspections. These inspections will be, made, will be made to ensure that each company maintains a valid Department of Motor Vehicle shop registration and we added with mechanics employees on premise and actively or able to repair, repair vehicles and that got added to the law too. So we had a public hearing on these additions. Um, we had a very lively discussion with nobody, and so um, we closed the public hearing, and it's on the agenda tonight for the town board to take action if so desired. So would somebody like to make a motion for the purposes of discussion? Well, I uh, make a motion to adopt the resolution to designate the town board lead agency to review the environmental impacts of the proposed changes to the code of the town of New Paltz in order to adopt this local law. Do I have a second to that motion? Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay, Aye. motion so carried. Aye. Do we have to go through this? Well, it's a short. I'll give yeah. you the body. The yeah, the please. body of it. Whereas the proposed amendment to the code of the town of New Paltz must be reviewed to determine any potential impact on the surrounding environment as defined by the Environmental Conservation Law in Section 8-01056. And whereas any project having a potential impact on the environment must have such impact determined by a lead agency pursuant to the state act and town code. Whereas pursuant to said state act and town code, a lead agency must be designated to review the proposed project. Now therefore be it resolved that the town board of the town of New Paltz designates the town board as the lead agency to determine all environmental matters and directs the town board follow the secret process for the aforementioned action within its jurisdiction. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion so carried. Now, shall we move on? Yes. I make a motion <laughs> to adopt the resolution and notice of determination of non-significance negative declaration on the local law to amend the code of the town of New Paltz, the, the toll list local law. Second. I'll give you the body. Whereas the town board of the town of New Paltz has declared itself lead agency under the State Environmental Quality Review Act as set forth in 6 NYCRR 617.6 D3 and whereas the town board of the town of New Paltz has compared the proposed action as described in the environmental assessment form parts 1 and 2 with the list of criteria set forth in 6 NYCRR 617.6 to and determine that the application proposed is a type two action. And now therefore be it resolved that in accordance with 6 NYCRR 617.6 A1I, the town of New Paltz Town Board finds that the proposal to amend the code of the town of New Paltz is exempt and the town board has no further responsibilities under the act. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Motion, motion so carried. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. Yes, it does. Well, you didn't explain anything. Oh. I, I read the changes to the towing law that we're amending, and I read those changes, and this is just part of the secret document for us to just do the action ac accordingly. But there's no environmental impact made by the changes that we're making. Okay, the rest okay. is just... Um, but but I, Everett, you heard the, what were the changes we're making to the towing law. I read the changes we're making to the towing law, and you heard that, right? So we're making a few changes to the towing law based on some incidents that happened. Hours of operation at 3 o'clock in the morning, no tow trucks in this town. What, see, no, we, we, that well, that's it. We actually, what we did was... Um, the, Sonny, it, I think Sonny retired. Mm -hmm. So we, we need all this put into that law. Um, and a guy we, has to be legally a tow truck, not a shot, a shot, a gypsy. Everybody's on the town. Now we need to do the resolution. Criteria law that the original I, I'm sorry, could you just give Yeah, you gotta take this. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. No, no, no. No, he's giving the correct information. Oh, yeah, I like it. I was going to get it. Anyway, it's, it's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the criteria that's been set up, actually, I think the last time it was adopted was in 2002 was the last change, somewhere around there. But the way the law reads, you have to be a repair shop, a registered repair shop by the state of New York. That's okay. Let me use this for now, but leave it here. Thanks. Uh, the vehicles are inspected to make sure they're registered to that company that is the legal repair shop. We have copies of driver's license uh, to make sure that all the operators are valid. Uh, they have to have insurance. They have to have insurance naming the town also as a, a additional insured. Um, and we do inspections of the station. The changes that we made here uh, basically are just indicating it takes away the ability for somebody to be a tow truck just coming through and towing cars. It makes you to be a legitimate repair shop. So if you're coming through the town of New Paltz and your car breaks down and you, the New Paltz police come to you and say, can we get you a tow truck? And they don't know who to call. We have a list that is uh, reviewed by the police department that meet the criteria of the town's law that they can say, yes, your vehicle is going to be towed to a location and they can also repair it for you. So you don't have to drive now two towns over to get your car back and get it fixed. Because if I, told you, I drove a tow truck as a young kid. Me too. Along okay. right. <laughs> the New York or California through. Okay? It's dangerous. You're going to meet the wrong people. Some of those guys hit 40 pounds in the back. Okay, okay. you know what, Everett? Every, it's uh, Chapter 41 of the Town of New Paul's Code. I'm on it right now because Carol Connolly has also connected this to the internet. It's just when people work really hard, they deserve on, it's credit. A, Joe gave a great synopsis of it. It's uh, Chapter 41 towing list. It has everything of it. It uh, goes from Paragraph 41 through 41-6, and uh, Chapter 41-4 gives you all the procedures and the criteria they need to meet and how they get dismissed. So, okay, could you please go on and review that? Any other questions, please feel free to come and see us or okay. call the office to Carol go call, call or Chief, call Chief. Joe and he'll be happy to review the law with you. But it, it is on our website and it took me 30 seconds to find it, right? Thank you. <laughs> Carol Connolly. So, so um, what I was going to say and see how great it is. We have our board members here and they can uh, access everything right now. Okay, okay. so we okay. did the vote, right? We took the yep. vote. Well, now we have to adopt. Now we have to adopt the resolution authorizing the local law. So would you local law number one of the year 2013. First local law we're passing. I make a motion to <laughs> adopt the resolution. Oh wow. We're not over-regulating this town. I want you all to Second. notice it's the first local law of the year and it's already uh, August. Second. Look. <laughs> you got a first, you got a second, and all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion so carried. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think we're done with you, Chief. Um, um, <laughs> okay, so thank you for joining us tonight, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, next well, uh, next up on the, um, um, next up is Stacy, our building inspector, and on deck um, will be Mo Hunk, and then on deck after that will be Dave Clauser, our engineer. So, with um, Stacy, we have two things to talk about. One is accessory apartments, so let's do a little background on that first. That uh, 
some of the concerns that this board has had, and um, it's been a specific concern of Kitty Brown, Councilwoman Brown, about how we can make the seniors in our community be able to afford to live in this community and be able to potentially rent out an accessory apartment in their house and have somebody who's there who helps pay their taxes and is also there to possibly like look over them so they're not alone. And But a concern was not to be able to have builders just come into the community and just build accessory apartments for the sake of building accessory apartments to basically maximize their profits. So we wanted to find a way to balance meeting the needs of our seniors while we also protect the integrity of our neighborhoods and uh, sort of have have some controls. So Stacy Delarade, our building inspector extraordinaire, one of our wonderful department heads, has worked on this diligently for a while. She worked on it with planning board chair, chair planning board attorney George Lithgow to come up with a way that works to make this a benefit for our seniors but protects again the neighborhood. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy um, for her to explain the second local law of the year that we might be bringing forward. <laughs> so, and for those of you following online, if you're on the New Paltz Town Code, it's section 140-17. Okay, so, Stacy, there's a microphone, and if you want, or you want to take this one. Yeah. Go ahead. Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> Five years in the making. Thank you, Susan. Five years in the making. That's all I've got. Thank you. Okay, so I don't know if you have had the opportunity to take a look at um, what I've got in front of you. Um, I did give you a cover letter. Um, we currently have an accessory apartment section in our zoning. Um, the problem with the law, the biggest problem with the law is that the way it's written, okay, any structure that was constructed after August... I'm sorry, excuse me for a second. Ira, I'm sorry, but can you guys take it up there? Sure. Thanks, go ahead. Any structure that was constructed after August 14th, 1986, is not eligible for an accessory apartment. So it's, it's, it's a problem. I have countless people come in wanting to do this. They get denied because their homes are too new. Um, so we've made some changes to the law and we've you okay? I'm fine. made some additions to the law. The change that we made was changing the eligibility date from August 14th, 1986 to the structure must be established, structure use must be established not less than seven years prior to the application. So the eligibility date will grow with time, okay? Because right now it's stagnant in 19, as 1986. Right. Um, that was the biggest change made to the law. Um, the other change we made to the law was that the way the law currently reads, it's only allowed in R1, A1 and a half, and A3 district. We changed the language that it's allowed in all districts where single family homes are permitted. Um, so that everybody equally is on the same playing field. So everybody can have it. Um, and then we made some additions. Um, because now, by opening it up from 1986 to 2006, um, we have a lot more eligibility. We have a lot of people that are looking at this and want this. Um, what we're including in the law, what we're adding to the law, um, is that the applicant must provide evidence that the structure was established, not less than seven years prior to the application, that the, we also added minimum lot area to include other. So if you go in the law, you'll see for detached structures, if you're in an R1 zone and you have a garage and you want to put an accessory apartment above the garage and it's detached from the house, okay? It requires you to have more land than if you had the apartment in the house because now you've got two separate dwellings and two separate buildings. So because we're allowing in all districts, okay, we've added the minimum lot area whatever the requirement is in those other districts to be multiplied by 0.75%, which is the same number used to calculate above. So if you're in an R1 district, you have to have 1.25 acres. Okay, so, you know, that's that's the multiplier for that additional section. Yeah, I have to, how about non-conforming? We have a lot, of, a lot. There, there's a, 
quite a number of non-conforming lots in the town. Would they be eligible then? Non-conforming lots have been eligible before in the town. Non-conforming lots have had accessory apartments. Um, we haven't changed any of the physical requirements for an accessory apartment. Okay. Minimum square footage, things right. like that. Right, it's still 35%. You still have to have one and a half parking spaces per dwelling unit. You still cannot have parking within any of the required yards. You know, you still have to have appropriate lighting. You can't have two front entrances. So none of the physical requirements have been changed from the law because those are good requirements. Um, it still has to be approved by the planning board with a special use permit. Um, and, which, but a non-conforming lot, though, would they be able to meet? the lot requirement. A non-conforming lot would not be able to meet a lot requirement for a detached structure. But an attached? But wood. inside the structure, inside, okay. like if you wanted to create an accessory apartment in your basement, yeah. um, you could do that, but okay. obviously if it's non-conforming, the lot's smaller than the requirement of the district, you're not going to be able to have the okay. detached okay. structure. Yep. And the county would still have to come back and approve the septic, or how, how would that yes. be kept? Yes, um, that's, that's, that's always been a requirement. Um, we changed the language, you know, language has been changed a little bit, but the requirement is, is that if you're adding a bedroom, okay, you have to have health department approval. Okay. Just, you know, so the planning board can't approve it without health department approval. They can approve it conditionally, pending health department approval. Just as to not, you know, make the applicant come back another month for a meeting, they can, you know, do the conditional thing. But yes, definitely have to have county approval for septic. Um, so um, we've also required in the law evidence, okay, of owner occupancy. Okay, because we don't want people getting accessory apartments and then renting both places. It has to be owner occupied, now we want evidence of that. Okay, um, we've added a section conditions of approval, and that's all the conditions the 35%, you have to do this, you have to do that. We just rearranged it all. Okay, um, it is a special use permit. We added that the special use permit has to be removed, renewed every year. This way, the owner has to provide us documentation that they're still owner-occupied. They're still occupying the primary residence. Because right now, there's no way to know who's living where. Mm -hmm. So Stacy, in the village, um, you have to have an annual safety inspection? That's a that's diff if, that's that's if different you rent. law. Okay, that's that's but this their, would be a rental. That's an accessory That's apartment. their non-owner occupied law. law. But these are owner occupied. Right. Totally different. I see. Okay. And that's coming down the pike. Okay. Okay. Um, we added language for inspections from the building department as permitted by law. You have to remember, one and two family dwellings are not the same as multiple dwellings. So we don't have the legal rights to inspection as you do a multiple dwelling, which is three or more, okay? So we've got language in there for inspections as allowed by law. Um, we've added an interesting um, section to this. Um, for detached structures, so if you're gonna put an apartment in your garage, okay, now you have two different buildings, two different dwellings, okay? We've added that a requirement of the approval, okay, is that a deed restriction of government or a covenant for the detached structures um, to remain subordinate to the principal structure be done. This way, when somebody sells, the buyer knows right up front at their title search that this is a special use permit, that the property cannot be subdivided divided and sold off that way. You know, it, it, it regulates it, because otherwise it could get could potentially get out of control, so we, we, we've added that. What we didn't add, and the more I thought about it, we didn't add anything for accessory apartments within dwellings for covenants. Um, and I think that we might want to look at adding a declaration for those. Okay, a declaration is different than a covenant. A, a declaration says, this is what this is. Okay, a, a covenant says, this is what you must do. 
So um, this way, upon a title search, a declaration will come up that says, this is an accessory dwelling, has to be owner occupied, so the new owner buying what he thinks is a two family house can't just rent it out. It, you know, because there's yeah. no way to tell a buyer you have to remain owner occupied. And this happens a lot. People have accessory apartments, they sell, the new owners buy it, and then they rent out both spaces. And we find out when somebody calls it. Stacy, so, on on that point though, are you asking for? Can you just get the are you are you requiring a specific covenant in a deed? Yes. See, I, I don't think you really need that. Every time a transaction occurs in any community, there's something called a municipal search, which your office is in charge of, and the municipal search is a report by the municipality about that particular property, whether or not it predates zoning, whether there's a CO for the main dwelling, and whether certificates of compliance have been issued for all improvements. That document itself could contain the information that you want, and it obviously is a definitive document, um, and the buyer then would become aware of that when the municipal report would come into their attorney. And I think you have more of a problem when you're trying to put something in a deed. Well, how about a declaration? Where's the declaration going to be? Declaration is filed with the county. So is the declaration going to be filed with the county, or is it going to be filed not, so not that the it's... The declaration wouldn't be filed on the deed as, as in, a, in a restriction or a covenant. The declaration would be sec sec separate. And declarations, from what I understand from George, can be changed. Right. So, a declaration is another filed document that would run with the land. Um, which, which is, in my opinion, better for the town because the town. has turnover in staff. This would follow the land. So the declaration, your concern, what, what, what specific concern are you trying to address with that declaration? The specific concern that I'm trying to address is that <clears throat> when someone creates an accessory apartment and then sells their home, the new buyer understand, knows and understands that the property must be the primary residence not the small apartment, the primary residence must be owner-occupied in order to continue with that special use permit. See, the special use permit itself can say that. It does, but how do you tell the buyer that? You also could have a separate category for assessment purposes that would have a code that would translate to principal residence with accessory apartment. That would also alert everybody that there's a new classification. Yes, it would, alert, it would alert them that there's an apartment and that the apartment may be legal, but not that it necessarily the primary residence has to be owner-occupied. But see, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I just don't want to create right. something that's too complex when it can be done in a more simple way. And I think your, your permit itself is the authority to use the property in that specific way. And obviously, if it's not used that way, you have your remedies, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I think you're protected that way. I think you have enough protection. Well, who because if they're in violation, you, you bring them in to court on a violation. Right. And, and they can say, oh, but they didn't I say didn't that know. in my deed. No, no but it's, it's not that I know right. it does. but. You're going to get into a huge mess by having incorporating different things and deeds. It's just that it's not a good way to do it. The way you do it is the municipal search, the municipal report is crucial to any real estate transaction, especially residential property. So that municipal search will say very specifically that this dual use is a dual use permitted only with respect to owner-occupied primary residence. How many oh. municipal... So it could... Uh, well, how many do you one other thing. Uh, so you month? couldn't do it for a second home, Every, correct? 
So, excuse me? No. If somebody it has, has to be owner occupied. Right. So, primary it's residence. a primary, not a secondary, right. primary residence, right, with an accessory. How many requests do you get? How many requests do you get every month? How many municipal searches do we get every month? Um, it varies. used to be more. It used to be. It, yes, yes. It, used, it used to be more. Um, I'd say in the past six months, we're averaging probably about 24 a month. Is that at 150 per? That's at 100, well, 100 per residential, yes. Okay. And that's for every sale? That's for every mortgage transaction. Title insurance companies, just so you know, when you buy a piece of property, your title insurance company will order a title search. As part of that, there's a municipal search and a patriot search and a bankruptcy search and all those searches. But the municipal search is a request directed to the town where the property exists for the town to report about what they know about the property. And it's a very important document and banks will not close or lend without the appropriate municipal search. And so that municipal search is a very important document. And, and so, but if a person buys cash and doesn't need a mortgage? They still need title. The title of the company makes that. Yeah. Okay. okay. But they have the option at that point to say, okay, fine, and, you know, ignore it. You know, and that's what happens sometimes in your cash deals when we come up with violations on properties. People are buying it together. Well, I, I can live with that, or oh, I'll take care of that later. I'll move it. They have that option. The banks make the current owner fix the problem, where in a cash deal, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. so you get into a problem, too, because let's say there's a fire, and then the accessory apartment, let's say it's above a garage, burns down, and it's never rebuilt. So now you have this deed that has a problem. Yeah. It says something, and it has to be corrected. Right. And so now you really run into a problem. So who's going to sign off on the document that changes the way the, pro the, the, the deed reads? Who's going to sign off on that? Well, the building inspector would, because if the use goes away, then there's no need for the declaration of the covenant. It just seems to me to be too burdensome, that, that process. I think it's easier to do it well, through. Can I propose okay, that we take, can we take Stacy's suggested changes and ask you to look at them and sure. bring them back and suggest okay. new language? I know exactly well, what you're doing. Can I, can I, I just say I something? Because there's something that really bothers me about the whole thing. So um, I'm probably the only one that it really bothers. And there might be a good reason why it's in there. Um, but I, I, there is absolutely a need for accessory apartments. I could see where it would w work well for young people who need the extra of if their parents wanted to relocate or why they wanted to downsize and get rid of their house or just wanted to spend more time with their grandchildren. And I can see it on the other side. If it were the parents and there's a lot of kids who get out of college and need to stay at home and if they had a little personal space it might be a little less uncomfortable. So it's, it's not the fact of an accessory apartment that's irking me. So there is a need for accessory apartments. Um, but to me, an accessory apartment is designed to be within that owner-occupied residence. And when you talk about putting one at the outside structure, like an apartment upstairs in a garage, from someone who's been living in the village for more than 20 years, that's a rental unit. That's not, that's not family. That's a rental unit. That's a money maker. Well, but your law allows that. The law has always allowed it, and an accessory apartment. Well, maybe it needs to be taken out. Maybe, but an accessory apartment is not just for family. An accessory apartment is just that, an accessory apartment. And there's no way to regulate who lives in an accessory apartment. We don't have the wherewithal to make sure that people who live in accessory apartments are oh. related. It's okay. a little different then than I, mother I misunderstood. You know why? Because I, right, I didn't read it. So we had a different law in the village, and so um, I didn't realize. So then this accessory apartment, it's actually creating rental units in the 
yes. town. Yes. And it's oh, already okay, existed. I need to read it. It right. already exists. Uh, You're just trying to already, modify it. It already exists. It's already there. Yes, I need to read it in depth. It, it just okay. relaxes it a little bit. And, um, you know, we keep hearing about the need for affordable senior housing in our mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. but we never actually get affordable senior housing. Mm -hmm. We have right. other senior housing options, and this is a way that particularly seniors can stay in the house they've always lived in, get some income, and I agree with you. My preference would be that it would be an internal accessory apartment, mm -hmm. but I encourage the seniors to get the rental income, but also the um, security of knowing that there's somebody else in that dwelling, and if you fall and you can't get up, right. somebody will notice. I agree. And we've had young people who have built new homes, and then a few years down the road, had had to take their parents in and ended right. up selling their homes and moving to a different town because, you know. The newer house wasn't eligible. Like mm -hmm. their independence. College graduates want their independence. Right. They still want their independence. The separate entrance is key. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, so well, what we're going to. For all your work. So what this. we're going to do is um, some of us are going to read it. And Kevin's going to um, you know, look through it a little bit more and then get together with Stacy, make whatever suggestions he thinks will help to accomplish what you want, and then we'll put it back on the agenda um, for one of our August meetings to basically come back and take it to the next step. So if everybody's okay with that, that's what we'll do. Great. Everybody okay? But thank you, Stacy, for all the work you've been doing on it. Thank you, I know you've been working on this for a long time, but she's not leaving yet. It's a great change, too. Okay. So what we also have next is, and I don't think we have a need to go into executive session for this because I do think we have discussed it, and I think the boards um, are the, um, the people who are not on the negotiating team, which is Kitty and Kevin, but I think we have discussed it when we've gone into executive session for contract negotiations. We uh, have been negotiating with the United Public Service Employees Union, which are all of the employees basically in town hall, the court clerks, Teresa from the police department, Carol West from the highway department, and all the people here. We had a number of negotiations, and the truth was most of the time was really spent correcting the inequities that have occurred over the years with all of these employees where different people would get hired at different times, they'd be brought in at rates that had no relevance to the position they were taking. They might have had a revel revel relevance to who the person was and who they were related to, or different things that doesn't matter, whatever. The point was there were a lot of inequities. And uh, so we spent a lot of time looking back to sort of see how do we make everything equitable? How do we create a baseline so when people come in, you know, they know what we're bringing them at, in at if they have certain experience. You know, we bring them in at a different level. So we're sort of compensating people for the level of experience of what they come in and sort of just make sure everybody's taken care of. Understanding, so we spent a lot of time on that. Then we got to the contract itself and um, everybody understood that of course times are not great and that you know we're all trying to sort of make it through without really imposing on the taxpayers but also valuing the work of the employees. And so we had what I think we all considered an incredibly successful negotiation. Very successful. <laughs> and it was very nice working with the personnel committee that we worked with to iron things out, get things straightened out, because we did it once we got where we needed to be, we did it very quickly. So it was a pleasure. So the um, employees ratified um, two days ago sitting around this table. I think there were 12 of you, all the employees, and they ratified it 12-0. Um, so every employee accepted the, uh, the negotiation. And so I'll take it through really quickly. So the contract is the January 2010 through 2031, 2011 collecting bar agreement between the parties is hereby modified as follows. All of the provisions remain unchanged except modifications dates were applicable. So the term of agreement would be January 1st, 2012 through December 31st, 2015. Now because the contracts um, we're not, we came in with the contracts expired. So the 2012, which is the year we're closing, is a 0% increase. So we're not going back, we're only going forward. 0% in 2012, 1.5% increase in 2013, 2% increase in January 2014, and a 2% increase in January 2015. 
Then um, we changed the, how we define um, part-time and full-time. Um, in the past, this particular contract was very convoluted where it was percentages. So if you worked between so many hours, like 20 hours to 22 hours, you got X percent um, you know, of days off and insurance and blah, 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 whatever. It was so complicated. And if you do this, so we came and clarified it so it was very straightforward. You can look at the contract and you know what the employee is entitled to when it comes for time off, when it in comes to health insurance, vacation days, and whatever. So we brought a lot of clarity and simplicity to the um, contract. So new section three and four will be added to read as follows. Section three, for the purpose of this agreement, a full-time employee will mean an employee who is regularly scheduled to work at least 30 hours per week throughout the year. Such employees shall receive full contractual benefits as set forth with here within. Section four, for the purpose of this agreement, a part-time employee shall mean an employee who's regularly scheduled to work less than 30 hours, but more than 20 hours per week throughout the year on a regular basis. Such employees shall receive one half of the leave time accrual and paid holidays if scheduled to work said holiday. So it sort of defines part-time in a much more clear way. Um, Article two, we added municipal code A to include titles. And then we added, for the health insurance section, employees hired on or after July 1st, 2013 shall pay 20% of the health insurance premium for individual and or family. And then we modified the uniform work clothing so people like Stacy can make sure she has the proper clothing when she goes out into the rain. Um, an employee who is required to wear a uniform must wear such uniform in accordance with the town board requirements. The employer shall provide all necessary uniforms and safety clothing is required and no cost to the employee. The municipal code enforcement officer shall receive up to $1,000 on an annual basis for the purchase of required uniform and work boots. And reimbursement shall be made upon the submission of a voucher and subject to approval. And so that's basically the changes to the contract. There was a side letter that basically um, identifies all the different employees and making sure that they were brought up to the adequate rate that they should get paid and making sure that um, because the town board was looking to change the personal policy to change how we define full-time and part-time and how they get health insurance benefits and the number of years taken to qualify to get full coverage for the rest of your life that certain employees were protected in terms of the changes we were making and that was a side agreement and so ultimately I think um, the negotiating team was very, very happy with the negotiations. We feel it's a very fair deal for the town and the taxpayers. The employees felt it was a very fair deal for them. And so we're asking the town board tonight to actually accept this contract and authorize me to sign it. Uh, so moved. Do I have a second? Second. Does and again, just to add, just for a comment, is one is yeah, uh, I really uh, the negotiating team and Stacy and everyone uh, understanding completely. Uh, one of the things was the equities. The other one was uh, a lot of the equities were involved around health insurance, and and I have to say is up to completely understood and and Susan I think will agree uh, agreed with us that one of our biggest expenses right now is our health care cost and I mean we actually had people working for the town potentially that were going to be the health care was going to exceed <laughs> their actual pay and uh, it's something that up to work tremendously with and as they say I really do appreciate what you your members and you know I think the vote shows that a 12 to 0 vote on that shows the that they completely yeah. understand and rank and file understands that the health care costs to this community are are a very serious issue, and it is the a major part of the iceberg ahead. And that you know we appreciate tremendously what you were willing to give, and it's something we're going to have to face continually. And, and we appreciate that also that you look very hard at what the plans we offer and, and are working within the plans that we are offering now. So thank you. And, and again, it did go very quickly once we sat down. I mean, the final meeting we closed it, and that was. Yeah. yeah, and again, most of the a lot of time was spent on the inequities, yeah. not not necessarily on the negotiation. It was really it was really fixing what was broken in the past and making sure that we weren't delivering a contract that was inequitable and continuing. So well, I, so what a wonderful precedent for all of our future negotiations. Mm -hmm. Everybody sat down and did the hard work, and we came up with a good contract. Thank yeah. you, Stacy. Just Thank one you. question: Nobody works 30 hours or less currently, right? 
30 you, hours or less? Yeah. Not at this point. There was not before, but not, not anymore. Well, Helen <laughs> works 30 hours. Yeah. Right. Chrissy but, works 30 hours. Yeah, nobody works less. Less. Right. Less. Okay. Um, but so we did it. We did. But we do. We, we have, have a... Eligible for help. Yeah. We no, do. no. We have a part-time clerk over at the courts. Or no? Full no, time. Just full time. Oh, okay. So no. you have somebody over there. Okay. We, we did have we did have people which were working less than what one would consider full time, you know, and getting no. Like what Jeff said, he's absolutely right. We had people that were making this much money and getting this much money in health insurance and working very few hours, and so we had that. But over the past year and a half, we've pretty much cleaned up any of that kind of unaffordable employee. Okay situations and right now we have a pretty solid working team in all the departments that are pretty much working full time and everything is pretty much okay. it's a good core okay okay so, right. so everybody in favor yeah. all in favor aye. Yeah. Aye, aye. okay motion so carried okay stacy thank you so much and you can uh, let uh, gary or whoever know that to draft the contracts and that we can get them signed. I will. Okay? Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Stace, so much for coming. Okay, next what we'll bring up uh, is the su uh, is um, Mohonk, and then we'll have Dave Clauser on deck for our um, municipal water supply definition system and an update on some exciting potential news about um, a town water supply and where we might be going to move forward on this. You know, we're accomplishing in the last six months of my <laughs> 12 years. <laughs> Everything that was in my first campaign platform is happening. Uh, so just, just remember, everything that Kitty wanted to do in 12 years, we're accomplishing in six months. Because we, we want Kitty to go out happy. Well. Or we want Kitty to run again. <laughs> Well, that, no, but this is the perfect time to leave. Uh -huh. Okay, so welcome, Mohunk. Thank you. Thanks for having us this evening. Uh, I thought I would... Um, Just talk, talk into the microphone, please. It's been a while since we've been in front of you. I thought I would start with a very quick review of this project. And thank you for posting um, our summary of our request uh, on your website it's just my lot it's pretty save cool huh? a few few acres of trees <laughs> i think it's a good thing we save a lot of trees because we still brought a lot of info for you so let me let me pass this around as well which is kind of um, a summary there are extras for folks who would like them and then um thank you there's a Kitty, did you get one? Um, I Kevin? Okay. Oh, this is the summary. Okay. And yeah, you got one, Rosanna? Would anybody in the audience like uh, copies of this? Okay. So um, thank you again. Um, I'm Glenn Hoagland, Executive Director of the Mohawk Preserve, and this is Eric Roth, my colleague, who is our Manager of Grants and Organizational Funding. And the request before you tonight is for what we hope will be the last planning grant for this project. Uh, you've been very helpful in supporting our past grants for the Greenway and the New York State Conservation Partnership, which have totaled over $52,000 in uh, grant uh, support for planning. Uh, and last, th about this time last year, you actually supported our uh, request to endorse a grant um, to the New York State consolidated funding application to the Office of Parks, Recreation, Historic Preservation, then we were awarded a half million dollar acquisition grant. So that goes towards purchasing this land from the Open Space Institute. They bought 857 acres in, 200, in 2011 from the Smiley family from the Hunk Mountain House. We are moving forward after having conducted our land asset management plan in 2011-2012 um, that plan reconciled for us what portion we could afford to buy and what, what portions operationally would be best suited to the preserve's ownership and management in the near term and the long term. And that is what you see on this map in front of you, the area outlined in red, which is three-fifths of what OSI bought from the Smileys. It includes the testimonial gateway starting in the valley and then the Humpo Marsh parcel and then wrapping around that to Kleinick Hill Farm up on the mountain. What it does not include is the 323 acres of farmland that Open Space Institute is retaining and has developed a programmatic thrust for um, that's separate from what the Mohan Preserve is doing, but will complement it. So um, what we're asking for tonight is your endorsement to pursue a $44,000 planning grant um, that will actually move us from phase one, which has been the acquisition of this land, which is still underway. We, we have um, the half million dollar state grant, the 
purchase price is 2.15 million and we have until 2015 to purchase it. We're raising private dollars through the Preserves Capital Campaign and that's, that's moving forward at pace. Um, but while we're doing that, we want to get going with the planning and, and ultimately be in a position to present a formal site plan application and to the planning board, hopefully by early 2014. We, what, what we want to do is get started now. Um, we've just hired the firm of Barton and LeJudis, um, a firm that's been around these parts for 50 years, um, like the Mohawk Preserve, and uh, who's also just been hired to redesign the entrance uh, and parking at Minnewaska. And um, we, um, this grant will partially defray the cost of that site plan approval process that we need to navigate through with the town. New Paltz. Um, we've been working with the Historic Preservation Commission. They would like to local landmark this um, property, we understand, this fall. I'm um, not sure exactly what their time frame is, but we're, we're delighted with um, having been able to support their reconnaissance and work to, to landmark the testimonial gateway and the land surrounding it. So that will really probably hopefully be the first action here before we even come to the town planning board. We're also going to start, as soon as we get, can get going with Barton and Judas, we're going to be introducing them to our neighbors, having meetings, formative planning meetings, before we come to the town uh, building inspector and engineer, and then ultimately to the planning board. So this, this grant will be part and parcel of that roughly estimated, you know, $150,000, $160,000 we estimate to get us all the way through a site plan and seeker approval process, uh, including the historic um, work with the Historic Preservation Commission to get a certificate of appropriateness, coordinated agency review, um, you know, the, the attendant cost to that process. That's really what we call phase two. Phase three comes after that, which is, you know, if when we get site plan approval from the town of New Paltz, um, and we're able to get subdivision approval and close on this property with Open Space Institute, we will begin raising the capital needed to install this trailhead. And so, um, you know, we estimate very roughly at this point, because those numbers aren't refined yet, will be refined as we get farther along in the planning process, but the actual installation of the trailhead and the stabilization, restoration of the historic structure, the, the wayside signage, et cetera, uh, the engineering, the, the SWIP, the, um, you know, uh, everything that's involved in that will be um, about, we think, 1.5 to 2.1 million. So the total investment in this this 534 acres in the near term will be the 2.15 in acquisition and about 2 million to install this trailhead and, and make sure that we've done it right with a managed, controlled off-road public access to this property and really repurposing that testimonial gateway um, to um, at least some some version of it's a earlier grandeur as, a, as an iconic cultural landscape. And uh, so with that, certainly I, I want to mention that Ron Knapp, the Preserves Board President this year, and Ron Glossman, the Executive Committee Chair on our board. Both and Sue Stegan and the neighbor. Sue Stegan from the <laughs> An interested neighbor. <laughs> and you have been including the neighbors in everything you've been doing, right? We've done a lot of work with the neighbors, not all of it, you know, even or perfect, but we want to get back to the table once we hire Barton and Judas and um, really hold some more robust neighbor meetings for this next phase. The objectives in the grant proposal specifically. You got to take that. The objectives in the grant proposal do specify um, public planning with workshops and sure analysis. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the board? Well, I've just been following this maybe a little bit more closely than other board members because the preserve has been coming to historic preservation meetings to work on the landmark designation and the amount of research that has been provided from preserve staff and from Karen Sobel on the historic preservation is, it, it's really very exciting. I mean, I didn't know how exciting history could be until I started looking at all of these documents and uh, well, of course, this is old news to someone like Eric. But, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I just walked the LA again today, and uh, to look at that structure and iconic is the word. I, I think that probably is the symbol of our town in, in so many ways. It's like having the Eiffel Tower in your town and watching it crumble. 
So um, I am just thrilled that somebody has stepped up to restore that um, iconic landmark and, and give it the care and the respect that it really deserves. I had, I had commented at the, uh, um, when we were doing the, uh, getting the money from the state, when they had the thing, I said that I was going to make that my town office and I was going to do Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down my hair, and the only way you could see me is if you climbed up my hair. <laughs> but it is a pretty amazing uh, structure. It is. So, it's, uh, it's wonderful. I thought you wanted a supervisor, town supervisor. They said it. That was going to be my office. And this way, the only way somebody can get to me was they had to climb up my hair. Yeah. If I have to grow it, but, but you know. <laughs> I noticed you just cut your hair. Yeah, right. So. I know. Well, you know, when you, you, you were so, abused, you, cut, I, I, you I keep cutting your kitty. But I think, Glenn, it does speak to everything you've done. And, and it's interesting that even today, both unbeknownst to each other, you had two of the board members spent our day up on Mohawk Preserve lands. Well, one of us had to go to work. But. That's why I skipped work. My I, See, I skipped work and I spent my son up there all day. Yeah, no, I don't. Yes, just, but, you know, this that's is, an amazing thing to be able to do. But the, uh, yeah, and, and I do hope, and, and Sue, please report to us if they're not, but I know there have been multiple meetings up there uh, with the neighbors, and, and I know the preserve is working very hard uh, with, with the neighbors up there. And again, I, I agree with Kitty is, you know, we were up, at, uh, went all the way up to the tower today and looking down and just seeing you know, the, the iconic tower. You, know, you can see the, the line of, of beautiful oak tree. Oh, 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 thank you. Beautiful oak trees going, going down. You know, to it, and just to see the restoration. And if, is the whole John Thompson? Is that is that whole presentation? He was it John? Yes. Is that available? I think absolutely. Yeah, we we've done that presentation. We're glad to do that. Is that uh, available online though? That. that all those um, photos or yeah, oh, a lot of those photos are in the land asset management plan, which is on the preserve's website. So if you go to mohawkpreserve.org, yep. under what we do, land conservation, you can scroll down and you can get either the abridged version of the plan or the whole 142 page. And, and I think if no one has done that, please do it uh, to see that most of the trees on the mountain not that long ago didn't even exist and that there was charcoal burning and tanning trees being torn down for the tanning and what it's become now is you know uh, we, you just don't realize how fortunate we are the smileys took over that land uh, because potentially it would have been a lot different <coughs> landscape we all sit here and look at so uh, you know I, I would like I, I fully endorse whatever we can do to do we need to make a motion? Well, I've just done some changes. Oh, to the I was going to make a motion um, authorizing a letter of support for the Mohonk Preserve uh, grant. Uh, excuse go, me, the, go, it's a municipal resolution that we sent. It's uh, language from the state specifically. I don't have it. Uh, actually, you know what? I didn't I know. Know. Kitty's kidding. Uh, oh, yeah, it's so on our website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kitty will read it. Uh -huh. How about that? Okay. On our website that Kitty can access because of the Wi Fi. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, All right, go home. It's a little slow, but nice picture of a heron. And I did see a heron at, at the pond by the LA today. Pretty. Yeah, there's one that lives in those ponds there. Are those yellow birds out in the fields? Um, are those just finches? Or they're bright yellow with black wings? She is, she is, she is. Come on, keep working. I am, I am. I'm, I'm making conversation while it loads. <laughs> oh, is that what you were doing? You thought you were getting distracted. No, 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 no. Burgers. Goldfinches. 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 No, I mean, I just saw them today. I'm sure they didn't have <laughs> bright yellow. They have black wings and a black. Is that a goldfinch? Okay. More. All right, we want the resolution. Yeah, we've been doing um, bio blitzes or bio decathons, they're called out there, with citizen science groups. And they've been um, over 100 species of migratory birds have been identified as wetlands. Several other species throughout that as ponds and wetlands. So that, that's all being put into our education and interpreting programs. Once we can get this land open to the public formally, you know what? It's not in there. It's in the program. No. Yeah. Yeah. This is the old I'll one. I'll see if it's in here. I think we'll right see. up. It's, I mean, I have so much paper. Uh, I have too wait, much paper. Wait, wait. She sent us an email called no. Mohawk Docs, and I bet it's going to be in there. Let's see if it's in here. Too bad there are no Zimit sightings anymore, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. 
Eric, it's called a resolu it's a resolu municipal resolution. I don't see it here. You got it? Final new pulse resolution. Well, yeah. Okay, While so I'm looking, I just she, want I think she's got to it. let you know that there's a letter of support from Karen Selbo of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, uh, endorsing the grant Can you have application a for the Mohawk Preserve. Yeah. That. I don't know why it's that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, All right. let it go. <laughs> She just okay. found it, so. You, find you it? did? No she problem. did, but it's on her little thing, so. I don't know why it won't. Dear Susan, keep can you go for That's it. That's last year. Glenn, where's the, where's the new trailhead going to be? I try to run and so, see if I. You so know, much money. That's really what the planning process is going to determine. Okay, okay. Man, came in on the north. Our goal and our hope is that it, the actual parking would be to the south of the testimonial gateway, tucked in that section of wide woods there, far away from uh, the, all the near neighbors, you know, in an area in a footprint that minimizes the impact on the wetlands, oh, mm -hmm. the open fields there, and the historic okay, structure. The, the challenges that might need to be overcome by a planning process are can we get site okay. distance off of the 299? Um, can we, you know, disturb the, that area minimally in terms of the oak forest, the wetlands? We're hoping that that is possible for a good site design because we'd so, like to see it. And then your trailhead would run run up to the preserve? Right. I mean, most people we think will use this area kind of as a, as a almost like a valley park, a loop trail That's system she that she will say reinforce that. that. But some people will go through and yes, up okay. to the pond and beyond. Okay. Okay, so we if it's okay, it. Kitty's going to read the resolution. Uh, whereas the Mohawk Preserve, Inc. is applying to the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation for a grant under the Environmental Protection Fund to be located at the Testimonial Gateway in the Shongam Mountain Foothills, a site located within the territorial jurisdiction of this town board of New Paltz and... Whereas, as a requirement under the rules of these programs, said not-for-profit corporation must obtain the approval slash endorsement of the governing body of the municipality in which the project will be located. Now, therefore, be it resolved by this august body <laughs> that the board of the town of New Paltz hereby does approve and endorse the application of Mohawk Preserve, Inc. for a grant under the Environmental Protection Fund known as the Testimonial Gateway Trailhead Project and located within this community. Well, do I have a motion to move it? I so, so moved. Okay, Jean moved, and Kitty, you want a second? Sure. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion so carried. I have to abstain. Okay, Kevin is abstaining. And motion carried. Thank you very much. You're very Thank welcome. You. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, so next, um, what we're going to do is. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, let's get Dave to come up here. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Good to see you. Thank you, Norm. You got to see the towing law done and the Mohunk thing get done. <laughs> okay, so um, what I think maybe we'll do is before we do the um, municipal water supply system, um, um, the, the, the change to the law to make sure it's in compliance for Bill's sake because he had read that, we'll, we'll do that first, so if he wants to leave after, I don't know. So I think what we'll do is a little update first of where we are. If everybody remembers, about two months ago, we had authorized uh, Dave Clouser, our town engineer, to start to look at a town water system for the town. I think for a number of years and years and years we've talked about creating our own system, trying to have a little bit more of our destiny in our own hands while we try to look at development on South Putt and, you know, and the places that we've designated as a corridor and that we needed to sort of really control a little bit of our destiny. So we authorized Dave to start looking at it and the project has grown a little bit bigger at this point to a much more potentially exciting level where we could possibly be taking care of the needs of the whole entire community. And so what I would like to do is turn it over to Dave to give an update of where we were, where we are, and where we're going. Okay. With the liquid gold of the future, water. <laughs> Clean water. Clean water, which is going to be the liquid gold of the future. 
I think it was back in May that the board authorized our firm to start the initial planning on a, a water system, a community-wide water system. And so we started to look at the water resource information. We looked at some uh, geological mapping of the area. We talked to some of the owners that we know that there's water on, wells that we know are producing wells. Uh, we tried to look at funding sources, and funding sources for new systems are not easy. Uh, they, there's some grants out there for repairs of systems, but new systems are tougher. We looked at water quality reports on the wells that we know about uh, to see if there's what kind of treatment was going to be necessary. And just reviewed what infrastructure is in place right now and what has to be considered as part of a new system. We uh, wanted to look at implementing a system that would serve the existing water districts of the town. That was our big goal. Um, and also be able to look far enough ahead to provide for expansion in the future. The schedule, there's kind of an elephant in the room here <laughs> on the schedule, and that's the, the aqueduct that's going to be doing some maintenance activities in 2016. And that's, you know, the clock's really ticking on that. So that was one of the reasons that whatever we do, we need to move on this. Um, other reasons are the cost of the water. The cost of the water is very high. It's also got higher here just a few months ago. And the ability for the town to be able to determine its future as far as development. Uh, right now, it's a, a situation where any extension that has to happen uh, for water service through the village uh, lines is requiring an annexation to the village. And that pretty much ties the town up as far as what they can approve for development unless there's wells that are drilled for each development. And that's a, kind of an issue because that determines the size of a de development, being able to be bring in a bigger uh, employer is is tough if they have to do their own water system. So we know that the DEP is going to be taking the aqueduct down for a 10-week period, and that's going to be in 2016, and they're going to be taking it down for a 10-week period several different times. It's not just once. Um, that was the biggest driver about we got to get going on this. There's planning and permitting and construction that are all have to be factors in, and three years is, is uh, a tight schedule. So over the past few weeks, we knew that the DEP was uh, trying to work to have a backup system for the community while the aqueduct was down. Um, as it turns out, Susan happens to know the DEP commissioner, and uh, she decided she would contact the commissioner and, and see if they were interested in working on a mutual opportunity here. Um, some people said that the DEP was probably not going to pay much attention because they don't have an agreement with the town. However, Susan wrote the letter on a Monday and they put it in regular mail and she got an email back on Wednesday and they were very interested in talking with the town. We've now met with them three meetings and uh, this morning was another meeting and I think we're really, we're moving ahead. It's a community-wide problem to be able to get this uh, backup system. I mean, right now, the village has one week's supply of water out of the reservoirs. If the aqueduct's down, something has to happen. So they're trying to work toward a solution to that. We thought that there would be 
a way to be able to get our needs met along with as a part of that process, the whole community's needs being met. So in that, with the meeting today, we talked about having the DEP come down to the town board and, and just explaining where they were at, uh, what the possibilities are, and that was set up, we were hoping for August 15th. It is set up for August 15th. That's right. <laughs> They are coming to the town of New Post on August 15th. I ask it to be tentative. The DEP. the DEP is going to come to the meeting on August 15th to present to the town. We should we should and ask the village well, if they want to participate in that meeting. Yeah, well we actually have every intention and we talked about that today with the DEP that um, we would be, um, it'll be a town board meeting. We, can, we will be inviting the village board to join us that night because the truth of the matter is the village has been, well, we know that the mayor's been working with the DEP. I don't know what the village board knows and doesn't know. I don't really know, but, you know, another, but they've got to solve their problem, but we are water users. Well, we, we have, we have members of the town outside the village that are water users. So right. in 2016, they're going to be influenced. There, there's going to have to be a plan in place because the water supply stops for a period of time. So, and quite frankly, we're, we've been interested for a long time now in developing our own sources of water that will support our needs going forward. So, um, I, I thank you, Dave, for your work. I think the DEP will probably be able to do some good things for our community. And uh, I'm thinking that if we can do this jointly with the village, it would make sense. Then we have one big water system for everybody, the whole town. Mm -hmm. The whole community, yeah. absolutely. Now, um, well, some of the things that we've learned through this process, which is interesting, is that actually the town is an entitled community, which basically means we're entitled to hook up to the aqueduct just like the villages. I don't think the town ever realized that, but we are actually an entitled community. So we could hook up to the aqueduct and create our own water system just by hooking up to the aqueduct. But that's not really, quote, the answer, because first of all, you have a system in place for the village to not sort of work together cooperatively would be crazy. The village system needs a lot of work. And we need an alternative system. And we also need an alternative system. One of the things that the DEP is trying to do is really ultimately get all of the communities that use the DEP water system off of their system. They really want the communities upstate to create their own water supply system so then they could just focus on giving water to the, the, the city, which is really their job, you know, and be a backup to the communities. And so they've done a lot of work. They did a very, very, very comprehensive study that shows the ability to access water, to potentially create a water system for the whole community, and um, there's a way to work cooperatively so we can work to create our system, loop in our wells, work with the DP to get their water source, work to meet the needs of the village, and have a community water system that solves the DP's problem, the town's problem, the village's problem, and ultimately the, a bigger county vision. I, I just want to go back to the very beginning of this and when when the village water goes offline in 2016 um, does DEP have any responsibility to help provide a secondary system? oh yeah that's why they've been meeting with the village for a while trying to work this out so if that water supply were to come from the town what we're saying is that DEP could invest in the yes town? absolutely and Completely, the totally. The investment would, would be very favorable to the town because they, there there is money for these systems right now okay. because of the the timeline that we're right. dealing with. So I mean, the aqueduct runs through the town, and actually the reservoir is on the town property. Is in the town, right? So how does that work with the village? Because the, the town, town the town has the town owns the land and did a lease with the village. It's a long term lease. Dave thinks it might have been renewed in under Don Wyland's administration. We need to get a copy of that lease and actually look at what kind of lease agreement we actually have with uh lease for the for the village plant. for the treatment plant. For the the treatment plant the village treatment plant is on town so property. The, is that right? 
a great deal dollar a year. Great deal. Oh. Great negotiation sure on behalf of the town. Yes. <laughs> great negotiation on behalf of the town. Kind of a hard bargain. Yeah, right. A dollar a year. And then they don't make any and kinds the taxes. of... taxes. The village pays the taxes. Uh, great. Congratulations. They could have driven uh -huh. a better deal okay. to make sure. Well, I just wanted to, you know, everybody who lives in the woods probably has a well. <laughs> I need some water in 2016. I know, and we're going to make sure we help the, uh, to get there. So, uh, do you have any idea, though, how long the lease is for, since you seem to know everything? Well, because I was on the other side. No, I know that. I know that's why I'm asking. Do you remember? I don't. I do remember how it was renewed because it expired. I remember that. And then I don't oh. want to put it on a microphone. <laughs> okay. okay, well, we're going to get the lease. We're going to look at it so we can understand. Okay. But it's probably not where I left it. Okay. So we're so going to have a meeting on the 15th. So we're, we're going gonna to have a meeting on the 15th. We're gonna, the DEP is going to come here. They're going to do a presentation yeah. of what potential we have to create a townwide water system Great. that uh, helps the village, helps the town, um, fits into the county's plan. After the meeting today, Dave and I, when we got done with the DEP in Kingston, we went up to um, Dennis Doyle at the county planning board to talk to him. And so Dennis is also going to come down and join us to talk about how this will fit into a you know, bigger plan and where the town and village should go jointly together. So we will have the DEP, we'll have the Austin County Planning Board, and we'll be inviting the village board to come join us to have this conversation to see if we can't start talking holistically about where we go together to meet our needs with water. So we've gotten commitments from Dennis, we've gotten commitments from the DEP, August 15th. We Thanks, will dedicate Dave. a meeting, to our, um, our workshop meeting to that. Yep. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so does anybody have any uh, questions or? Dennis was brought in early on this. And they're, they're part of this. Yeah. Well, at a certain point when we understood that there was some water potentially, you know, out by the county property, and so once we knew that that was a potential, I sort of felt the best thing was to get the county in right away and start having conversations with them. So this way, you know, again, if you can bring everybody in, you know, when you need to bring them in and you're all working together, maybe you could solve the problem. So that's the goal. August 15th, we were really delighted today that we were able to invite them and they were willing to accept and they're very happy and excited. So with that, um, the next thing we'll do is the municipal water supply definition. Uh, so we met, we had met with Dennis actually, with George Lithgow at that same meeting we talked about the potential water supply um, and we talked about the definition of the municipal water supply system for RV districts. Dennis had some concerns that he wanted address, addressed, which I think Dave could explain, those, or, or Kevin for that matter. We made the changes, we wanted Kevin to have the chance to review it a little bit closer, of which Kevin did, and so I'll throw it over to Dave and Kevin to see how you want to proceed tonight in terms of whether or not we set the public hearing or keep some, talking. Some changes about making sure that the system would be up to town standards that Kitty and Jeff, I think, mentioned the last time, wanted that information included. Uh, Dennis's concerns was he was looking at it to make sure that it was not something that would going to be a, a, to apply to the, like the R1 districts, for example. And if it did apply to the R1 districts, uh, or this type of system, then they would get double density. So that was something that uh, George made sure with his change that that wouldn't apply to uh, just the single RV. families, right? So that wouldn't pretend well, that would later on. We could then look at changing some of our good later on. Our, our zoning that would affect our zoning later on. So we may want us. May want to watch it. In the future, you would be wanting to look at your R1 zoning and potentially change it to RV zoning to encourage development in that if you have a water supply. That's right. That's a good thing. So oh, oh, no, it's oh, 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 no, I'm not saying that. It's just that I, I guess the reason I was just looking perplexed is because I'm no, starting no, to wonder no. how much more residential development we want in the town versus starting no, to get like... That's why you would want to residential area. We okay. want to look at an RV. Okay. Potentially, it could bring, it would invite, an R1 area could potentially bring in what something Kitty has always wanted too, which is PUDs. I prefer them to... RV. Absolutely. Now that, now that we know what an RV right. can okay. and cannot right. do, but potentially you could bring in okay. an RV district with a PUD in it. So we have to put that on the agenda to do before the next six months so we get that done for Kitty also. Okay? So, so um, just 
for when we meet next week. Um, you know, we, we've talked about possible sites for future water, and people in the community have said, well, there's salt from the throughway in some locations, and there's arsenic in other locations, and so just so we're ready to be able to talk about, um, I mean, I would imagine that the surface of the earth is full of that problem almost anywhere, but just, um, so that we are prepared to talk about that. Right? Yeah, I've been looking at the water quality reports on past pump tests and okay. trying to make sure I have that information up to date. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of the municipal definition, is everybody willing to accept that and set a public hearing, I think, is the next step? Yeah. It's fine. Okay, so is that what's... Public hearing on the 15th or the 22nd at 7.15? I think it would be best to have it on the 22nd. I think so. Okay. Yeah, because I don't want to have anything. Okay, so can I have a motion to set the public hearing for? So move. So move. Second. Okay, so you've got that. Okay, so August 22nd, 715, guys, for the public hearing yep. on the um, definition of the municipal water system? Yep. Terrific. Okay, so do, I, 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 do we have to do that as a motion to set the public hearing? Yes. We moved and seconded. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion so carried. Okay, great. Do we have anything else for Dave before he leaves? No. No, no, no. Thank you, Dave. It's been enjoyable spending the day with you today. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Okay, so now let's get to Kitty's um, IDA letter. So she did send one. I saw it. I just want to see the last paragraph. It didn't have the attachment when you sent it. The my my letter. Yeah. What? The, the revised letter. What? The last no. version. No. Well, this was I Kitty's version. What? No. The last was, one I saw today. I, on I my you that was that was Kitty's that right. was Kitty's version. And what I basically had said at the meeting was that I wasn't averse to sending a letter. I just sort of thought that um, the letter might be able to be a little bit more diplomatic. If, uh, and Kitty said that she has a tendency sometimes to get indignant, and so she had no problem with me trying to rewrite it. So I don't know, Kevin, if you want to read her letter first. No, I, 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 I already read this letter. I yes. <laughs> <laughs> I read this. Okay. You said that. I know. Do you want to read your letter and then I'll no, read my I letter? I need to refresh myself. And see. Well, it's right there. I had printed it. Oh, that's mine? Okay. Yes, that's your letter. Oh, no, do you have Kitty's letter? Yes, I do. Uh, and you write that. I, I'm very happy to have people edit a man. Um, you know what? My point in drafting the letter is that I hope that we won't be in an adversarial uh, situation. Um, Mike um, might have been late when we were talking about this last week because the the problem <coughs> is not. Um, the SUNY Foundation actually owns the property now. It's not a question of them transferring the property to SUNY, the, to the New Falls Foundation. They actually do own it now. Um, the question is whether uh, the Kevin, I rewrote it. Developer would I rewrote it shift from being Wilmorite to the actual foundation. In which case, the foundation would then hire Wilmorite as the manager, but that's um, that's what would permit it to become completely off the tax rolls, even though it is owned by a nonprofit right now. It, it, under the agreement that they have with Wilmorite right now, it is uh, eligible for a pilot in exactly the same way the uh, Kingston Health Alliance and New Life Management proceeded. And and I do think it's worth noting, I mean, it's in today's paper that the executive director of the Health Alliance of Kingston just resigned, um, who are managing Woodland Pond, right? They are the managers. Mm -hmm. And there was some discussion about whether or not his $700,000 a year <laughs> salary was appropriate. Um, but I, you know. It's a not for profit, isn't it? It's a not for profit. Mm -hmm. And it's lost $12 million, That's I believe. $700,000 well, for you, one you salary? You skipped the good news, though. They were, uh, they were originally forecast to lose $14 million. Oh. <laughs> so the good news is, is they've. Lost less than they said they would. 
But they're full, aren't they? They're not full. No, 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 they're not full. The, the holes, aren't they? No, they're not full. No, they're not full. They're, they're not full. full. So what I, I did, I, th I think, I do know that I think Carol posted it. Um, we didn't, I wrote it at 5 o'clock tonight because I was no, so I busy all day. I think that revision is good. But I, so I'll read the revision to the board. So I think if Carol did try to send it, but if not, That's and fine. I think it is posted, as a matter of fact, but I'm not positive. So I wrote, Dear President of the Foundation, as we understand, Wilma Wright made a conscious decision to comply with town zoning and work with the community to enter into negotiations for payment in lieu of taxes. As you are well aware, this, uh, there is an extraordinary amount of property tax property off the tax rolls, and the stress on those paying the taxes is getting worse every year. The addition of another project in the town that will not be paying its fair share has created a serious backlash against the Park Point project. While the pilot negotiations have yet to take place and may result in a fair and equitable settlement, settlement there are, quote, rumors that the Foundation and Wilma Wright intend to utilize the not-for-profit status to take this project off the tax rolls completely. In order for the pilot negotiations to take place in good faith, the town board is asking for a clarification on the intent of the foundation and the applicant. The town of New Pulse truly appreciates having this wonderful institution in the community. However, it is incredibly important that the burden of providing for the increased services to the town due to the addition of this project is not on the shoulders of the existing overburdened taxpayers. Many members of the foundation are residents of our community and share the burden of the New Pulse taxes. We hope the foundation understands the pressures on our community if you should choose to burden us with another tax-exempt project. We look forward to receiving a response before our next town board meeting schedule for August 15th, 2013. Respectfully, the New Pulse Town Board. So I that think, was... I think you've out, out in... Indignated me. <laughs> I, I don't think this letter is indignant I, at all. Oh, I think okay. this letter is. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Should the we? Thing is, I, I, I don't. Maybe I didn't do it in my letter, but I'm not hearing in your letter the actual question that we need an answer to. I did. It says right here. Um, Taking the property off. The tax. I said. Um, um, Okay, I said, there are rumors that the foundation will might intend to utilize the not-for-profit status to take this project off the tax rolls completely. And so, the and then I say a later, sentence right there that says, we are writing to ask if this is something your board has contemplated. I can put that in there, that's not a problem, but I did say right here, um, um, Kitty, whether they've yes. contemplated or not, though, really, ultimately isn't oh I say right here you know I, mean? I asked it's because I'm sure they discussed sure. no no Kitty this is what I asked let me can I read it again because she okay um, while the pilot negotiations have yet to take place and may result in a fair and equitable settlement there are rumors that the foundation and Wilma Wright intend to utilize the not-for-profit status to take this project off the tax rolls completely in order for the pilot negotiations to take place in good faith the town board is asking for clarification on the intent of the foundation and the applicant yeah I think that covers it Kitty. so that is basically Exciting. What's your intent? And then later I say, many members of the foundation are residents of our community and share the burden. Uh, I understand well, that. You know, I, I don't know. And we look forward to receiving a response. I, I guess I would just like a really clear yes or no question. Have you now or will you ever consider uh, taking over, you know, withdrawing the current uh, application with Wilma Wright and um, becoming the developer and landlord yourself, thereby completely removing the project. Well, we could now or any time in the future. Is that yeah. your question? Yeah. Okay, so let me just is, okay. So that would probably be added to in order for the pilot negotiation to play, take place in good faith. The town board is asking for clarification on the intent of the foundation and the applicant. So how would you want me to rephrase that? It's now and in the future. It's asking, well, but I mean, the question is whether or not the foundation has discussed. But if they have or haven't, it really doesn't matter. What, what matters is what their intent is, and that's what she's asking. So we're concerned about now and in the future, right? So with respect to the in the future piece, if there is a pilot, the pilot can be designed so that even if the status flips in the future, 
you can accelerate the balance of the payments and have them do. So you can structure that kitty in a way where if they want to do that, then they're going to pay the premium mm -hmm. associated with making that move. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we'd be hurt at all. So is there something? I don't know. I mean, I guess what I would like is the, the foundation's assurance that they will not consider taking over the management. I don't taking, know if we can. Well, they're not taking over the management. I, I don't think we can ask just them. Just asking, because I, I, that, that's the whole thing. Well, we have no control over but anything. But they can the, change their mind tomorrow. They mm -hmm. could say. A and tomorrow decide it's B, and so I don't think we can ask them to give us a definitive statement that will be true for the next 30 years. Well, that's right. They say something. No, we have no intent today, but right. when they're still in front of the planning board seven months later, they might change their mind. No. Um, I mean, we, we should ask to be notified. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, the whole question really only arises if Wilmerite doesn't like the pilot that we agree on. Well, and that's the, the cart and the horse. Why aren't we talking to them about it already? Well, I will. And I don't understand that. Well, actually, um, I have some ideas of how to, um, A, get a lump sum of cash, you know, based on the fact that there's a 450 to 750 um, range that we would get per room. And um, to get per room, and we were told, remember I said that Marge Gallagher had said that we could actually go beyond the 750. We could ask for 850 to to $1,000 if we believe that's going to be our cost. So we could literally negotiate how much cash we want. Maybe $1,000 a room, $750,000 in cash. A year. In my, in a year. In my mind, the way I'm looking at this pilot for the moment is if they owe us a million five, technically, and what they would be paying in taxes, then you work with the million five, what are we going to get in cash, and then what kind of in-kind service can we consider that we get? And I've recently learned there's a thing called a pilot incentive. So you could actually negotiate some type of incentive that's a benefit to the community. So how do we take the difference between the cash we get and then we quantify an incentive between the 750 to the 1.5 million dollars and what would that incentive look like? Could it be something that has benefits us with the sewer and water? Could it be something that benefits us with the project directly from an environmental perspective? And so there's some ideas of talking to different people that have been coming together in a way. So um, Dave and I actually have been talking about some of these ideas. I did make a call to Mike Moriello yesterday to ask if I could meet with him to talk about how to move this pilot along in a way that would benefit the community and we would feel like we're getting our fair share and see if it's even a possibility. So hopefully Dave and I are going to be talking to Michael next week to see about if something could even be feasible that I think we would all really be happy with. Um, today I met with the governor's regional rep for about an hour, talked to him about the water system, talked to him about Sam Plesser's property, about how we don't want retail, that we could have to do some kind of really outstanding project is about South Putt. We talked about Park Point. We talked about how to make that pilot so the community gets their fair share. And I was really, really clear about the pilot, about the Startup New York. We talked all about the Startup New York and the tax-free zone and how that would be implemented in a way that this community would not get hurt and how we could take it and turn it around and use it as a benefit for this community because, you know, I was very, very clear with him about the burden on us, the property off the tax rolls, and any of these kinds of projects, how really sensitive we are to them. So let's start to look at this stuff that you're trying to do, but turn it around where it becomes a benefit for the community instead of a burden and let's stop, let's stop fighting. And so um, I spoke with the governor's assistant about some ideas and he was very, very excited and said that this could be really, really good and they could bring in other resources from the state to benefit the community. So I'm having the conversations to the best of my ability to try to make sure that um, things are happening. It's just that you can't negotiate in public. You know, you have to sort of do it and make it happen and then, you know, hopefully we get something. So hopefully next Tuesday I'm going to have a conversation with Mike Moriello on a way to negotiate a um, substantial payment in lieu taxes in cash and then a pilot incentive that matches, you know, brings us up to the $1.5 million. So hopefully there's some things that are in the works, some conversations that are going on and, you know, well, maybe. I, I think you, gotta, you, you cover a lot of things there. One is, is that there's the 42 acres and it's 50 acres total and the more 
you know, Jam has that right, right, right. for what may or may not be waste trick. It depends what we do. Uh, one is also, uh, Mike Moriello is not the attorney at the IDA. For no, he's the, he's the attorney for the project. For Gossel, yeah, and, and so... He's what not I, the attorney at the IDA, and he hasn't been right. doing the discussions for the IDA uh, or any of the exemptions. So you also might want to ask Mike if there's another attorney to invite from Wilmerite to come mm -hmm. up with you guys who's doing the IDA negotiations. Well, yeah. actually, we the this. reason... He's just the attorney on the project. Well, no, that I know, and I actually, he has to get permission from Wilmerite to even have this conversation right. with me, and he was very clear that he's the attorney for Wilmerite, and so in order to meet with me, and I said, look, you can bring the Wilmerite attorneys. I said, but the truth is, Michael, I said, you live in this community. Uh, you know, we live in this community. This project is an incredibly um, controversial project. You know that it's not going very well right now for Wilmerite by any means, and so I would like to have a conversation with you, myself, and Dave about about um, about. Um, I was going to say about how we move forward in a way for the community without having Wilmerite in the room because. Well, you do. Have, if you have Mike, you have Wilmerite in the room. So I mean, in regard, if you think it'll be productive, I'm all for it. Yeah. And I think the other piece is too, though. But uh, Kitty's, I. I I think Kitty's question is a very straightforward one, is maybe not even using the rumors in quotes, which is, if their intent is to pass it over, is, is that a yes or no? Do you have an intent to... Well, let's find to a way to... Get rid of the word rumors, even. Do you have any intent to pass this property over? And also, uh, and maybe discuss this, which is, there is a large piece of the property that they are saying they are keeping as open space. It, it's somewhere around 30 acres about, approximately. Uh, can they also give us a guarantee that they will put, they, they are refusing to put that land into a conservation easement? They say they absolutely will not, and uh, they've used the phrase, our, their attorneys have not used the phrase, but they've used the phrase uh, that they are not allowed to. Uh, no attorney, the attorney. That they have been advised and they are not allowed to take over the space that they have. And again, this can go quote unquote that they will keep as green space. And this would be the space that's to the uh, southwest of the proposed development. Uh, it's a, again somewhere between 25 and 30 acres. Uh, would they be willing to also put that into a conservation easement with the town? Uh, because again, I, I don't want to see us. I mean, I don't think there's anyone at this table that doesn't want to, that doesn't believe this is a good project, but just not at the cost to our taxpayers and our community. We all agree to that. This is a good project. I don't want to have to be sitting here or sitting in the audience here and in 10 years having a conversation again about those 30-some acres that they promised us would be green, but now they are going to develop those into, make something up, Kevin, what yeah. they develop them into? Another, uh, another 732 Another 732 yeah. beds. But you know, Jeff, I'm glad you reminded us of that because that's the kind of thing that gets forgotten and it was probably two years ago when we were talking about that and the foundation and that's when we started saying we need to understand the foundation's role a little better because the foundation said we can't uh, compromise our fiduciary responsibility to keep that parcel as a potential revenue generating. Well, couldn't that parcel then... Can we just use the microphone, please? Couldn't the excess property now fall within the governor's new tax free zone, and which Absolutely. makes it more valuable? Absolutely, and you know, and, and I almost hate to sure. say it and volunteer Kevin's time, but I don't know if <laughs> Susan, if, if they do, if Mike brings to the meeting, if Kevin is available because he is very familiar <laughs> with land use laws, because that's where he does it. Is uh, Kevin could be there maybe too? It might be interesting just because maybe again I'm very scared that there seems to be they have stopped the conversation completely on the excess land. Now we've all agreed as a community we want that corridor developed, but we don't want that corridor developed at the cost to. Uh -huh. There's a flip us. side to Jeff's statement, which is here we're being asked to take less to allow a project to go forward that could potentially allow them to capitalize even more mm -hmm. in a manner that we don't, as a community, mm -hmm. benefit. 
So we're asking, they're asking for a discount now while retaining a substantial value in terms yeah. of an unused asset. And we well, actually well, might be able to help them. I mean, this could actually be a point where we could, could help a, them yeah. develop it. I mean, if they, right. if they want to sit in a meeting with you Tell over us. the next two well, years and say, look, you know, those are the 30 acres. You know what? You're right. Maybe we will develop them, and maybe it's to Kevin's point. Maybe part of it is to use it under the governor's plan, which none of us here support. Well, which, which, I, well, which I, will, I, I will... Maybe we could help them. You know, maybe this could yeah. be part of the municipal water. Maybe this could be part of... Uh, of us rezoning more mm -hmm. of the land. You're, right. Yeah. You're right. I, You're right. I don't know now, but I, I will say I will. Too much. I will say, um, Jeff, that um, what I was told today is. Um, <laughs> Of course, because I had made a comment today to the governor's regional person about the fact when I was explaining the municipal water system and all the work that we're doing, and I said, I said, but the crazy thing is, I said, our community um, designated a certain area for our industrial corridor to bring a tax base in. I said, now we're working and in investing money to basically create a water system. I said, and water and sewer. I said, so what? We're going to invest money to create water and sewer, so now the state can give that land away uh, as a tax-free, you know, whatever. We might as well just stop developing water. And Sue at this particular moment in time and say, go develop it on your own, leave us alone. You know, this is crazy. So what I said, so I said to him, so I said to him today, I said, but I said, look, I said, you want to do these tax-free zones. You know how we feel. And I explained to him, and I told you guys the morning when I got home that night from all day on fracking, where I was meeting with one of the governor's deputies on fracking. Um, and I got home and got a phone call from the chief on something, and then I was told I was invited the next day to this tax-free thing. The first thing I did at 8 o'clock at night was I emailed the deputy director that I was meeting with. I said, thank you for meeting with us today. I know this is not your area, but the um, person that I would speak to in the governor's office's email is a town hall. The governor's coming tomorrow to announce this tax-free zone. Can somebody please give him a head up, heads up to what he's walking into? And then I proceeded to explain about all the property off the tax rolls. I explained about the Park Point project and what was going on with the Park Point project. I talked about the fact that the SUNY campus has a bigger police department with more officers and a larger budget than our police department that we have to take care of the students downtown. And I said the governor needs to know what he's walking into when he presents a tax-free zone in New Paltz, New York. And then I went to sleep. And at 8.30 I went to the doctor, and at 11.30, when I got back into cell range, I had six phone calls from Amy Vargas, who works for the governor down in um, um, Newport, in Newburgh. I had a call from Legislator Rodriguez that Amy Vargas was trying to get in touch with me. I had a phone call from the head of the Ulster County Democrats that Amy Vargas from the governor's office was trying to get in touch with me. I must have had eight phone calls from the governor's office calling me to say, Okay, Susan, tell us what we're walking into, okay? Because and then and they still at, let you show up. And then not only did let me show up, I sat three seats from him. Okay, then 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 at the end of it, I actually spoke to the person who introduced him to say, "Do you understand what this project means to New Paltz?" And you know, and I we had a whole long talk about it. And he said, "We'll have to talk about it again." So I have not been quiet about how I feel about this, um, you know, relative to people that I've been talking to. Okay. What I will so. tell you today, though, is what I was told today. There is somebody up at the stage who works on the tax-free zone, he, the governor's assistant's getting in touch with him for him to get in touch with us to talk to us about it. And I said, and you know, to talk about it, and I said to him, look, I said, if you're looking to do this, I said, we don't have to be adversaries. I said, we could work together to turn this around. I said, to make it work for the college, but you have to make it work okay. for the local community. Here, here's, so, what I, here's what I want you to ask them, I, because I, um, we all know that the pilots and the IDA and tax free zone is all about creating jobs, right? We're going to create jobs. Right, well. And, and the IDAs have a terrible track record of actually documenting and um, making sure that the jobs that are promised exist. And they've been, the Ulster County IDA has actually been pretty good about admitting that if you look at their records. Mm -hmm. and, um, the Fiscal Policy Institute has done a million exposés on it, and the whole thing is just a gigantic failure. So even if in the most generous spirit you were to say, okay, we created 50 jobs in New Paltz in the last 10 years, and okay, we gave away $50 million of revenue, I asked the um, yeah, personnel well, right. department of Ulster County to tell us how many jobs have been cut in Ulster County in the last Awful 10 lot. years, which is about how long the IDA has been really active. 300 full-time jobs. 
these are great jobs that help people in social mental health and social services have been decimated. That's right. Highways. I mean, all the services we need. And I mean, I guess you can argue that there is fat in the budget and maybe there are a few extra employees that you really need, but not if you look at foster care, not if you look at Golden Hill shutting down. To dismantling Golden Hill alone is costing, I forgot mm -hmm. how many full-time equivalent jobs. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, kitty, 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 in the past couple of years, I've watched, I mean, I've been up in the legislature when they have these jobs. We have no mental health left. There's no mental health. It's all whatever. But meanwhile, the, the I know. governor and the IDAs continue to say we're going to create jobs. For every job they create, we lose five or ten important public service jobs, mm -hmm. and it's it's just a disgrace. Well, I, I think there's no then. To get, back to, to, yes. Yes. to get back to the indignant letter, <laughs> uh, I, I just think that I, it just, the, the two, the, the only thing is, is I have, uh, I'm just wondering if taking out the word rumors and just changing that all to a direct question. Okay, so let's. Right, it, right. it's a question, it's not. A, so can you just try to, can you think of something to rephrase, Jeff? Uh, uh, while the pilot negotiations have yet to take place and may result in a fair and equitable settlement, uh, the question still lingers. The, the, the question still lingers. That the town board would like to, would like a response to the question: Is the foundation and uh, is the foundation and Wilmerite do, does the foundation Wilmerite intend to utilize a non-for-profit status to take the project off the tax rolls completely at some point in the future. Right. Or, or um, some would like a response to, to the, the question. If the foundation and applicant. Yeah, applicant sure could, could, could change. Right. Plan. Or intend, keep the word in, in, in intend. Intend. Intend to keep the same set in the end of right. the same. Intend. To utilize the not-for-profit status to take this practice off the tax rolls completely right. if the negotiations do not proceed or... If, if Wilmerite uh, is not satisfied with the ultimate pilot agreement. Okay. And I, I don't know if anyone was interested, but also let's include another question, which would, do you want to include the question about the open space? Actually, they're the ones who said that, so I would. So maybe another paragraph, a very simple paragraph. Uh, the current site plan indicates that there will be a area of... I, uh, okay. Well, then let's do it then somewhere... Area um, of open space. Uh, and the it. town board had requested that it be... Into okay, wait, wait, but just wait one second because right now I'm just okay. trying to see where that would. Well, I'm just trying to see where it would fit in because right now this is all about the taxes. So. Um, no, I know. I'm just looking to see where the question is because right now this is all relative to. Um, okay, so. Okay, but so, but I'm just so after I think Jeff maybe where it says many members of the foundation are residents of our community and share the burden of the new polls taxes. We would hope the foundation understands the pressure on our community if you choose the burden to burden us with another tax exempt project. And then how about if I put in there another question the town board would like addressed. So this letter is on. It, yeah, this is uh, Carol. Put it Carol, I think put it on. Yeah, uh, it's on the it's meeting. Uh, okay. It's on the right side. So I got done writing it at a quarter to seven, and Carol had it up by ten to seven. Amazing. Another question the town board would like answered or addressed would yes. like addressed is the uh, approximately twenty-five acres of open space in. Uh, an open space on the property that the planning board had requested be put into a conservation easement. Okay, one second, Jeff. The planning board. Uh, you know, I can write it and email it. Okay. To or Jeff could write it and email it. Email. Just go to go to today's meeting. Right side. Over there. No, it's on. It's oh. On. You go in there. And you just said, Jeff, 25 acres? Uh, you know, I don't know the exact yeah. amount. I said about approximately 25 more acres. More plus or minus. Or yeah, plus or minus. Okay. So another question the town board would like addressed is the approximate 25 plus or minus acres of open space in the property that the planning board, that no, is on the property, that the planning board requested be put in a conversation easement. And so what's the question? 
Hello. I don't know why yours didn't work. Yours didn't translate. Mine did. Wow. So what's the question, Jeff? Uh, yeah, uh, okay, another question the town board would be why uh, well, the question, Kitty, is um, why will this not uh, be We were informed that upon your attorney's advice, you may not grant a conservation easement on this property. Um, but in our experience, nonprofits frequently uh, donate conservation easements, and we would like the opportunity to discuss this with you further. How would they get their site plan approved without a conservation easement? Why do it why just doesn't show anything on the plan? It just shows, you know, undeveloped space. land. Kitty, I have a question for you. But what I'm saying is the 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 site plan itself doesn't have to be approved by the planning board until that conservation easement. Yeah, but a condition you, you, you can't make a condition of approval over a conservation easement. Uh, that's not a valid condition of approval or not approval. Okay, you can put whatever condition you want. You would, uh, you could speak to Kevin. Could speak probably more than I could, but I. Uh, you could, you could have as many conditions as you want. But would they, but would it get approved or not? Though would be the question of saying. But the planning board could just say this undeveloped parcel shall it remain undeveloped. But, but suppose we want to develop it, it developed, and suppose the governor's plan works, and there's a high tech company that wants to come in that parcel's not available, so they can't come in. So I think we have to, we have to really, like back to Jeff's point, we really need to, to really think about what we want to do and say and, and have a discussion with them about where things can go in the future. That's what we need to do. We, I don't think we can dictate to them what they can do and can't do. I think we have to have a discussion with them about it. So, okay. Is that they have to also compromise in order to get an approved. There has site to plan. be a discussion, and yes. that's that hasn't occurred I, yet. I, okay. So, so then, how about is it okay, Jeff, for the purposes of this letter, taking out the stuff about the open space because maybe it is yeah, a bigger yeah, conversation, yeah. and let's just focus on the pilot and the not-for-profit status and the potential for this to be taken off the tax rolls, and leave it focused on uh, that I for now, that, and we can always. That open space so is a valid conversation. If, yeah. If sit with Mike. Yeah. And like I said, if Kevin's available. Tuesday be morning. Tuesday morning, eight fifteen. Yeah. As long well, as he gets a permission. I would actually, like is to okay. See, at Dave's right. office. Is right. to see their attorney's letter. I think they actually said they had a letter. I'd like to see that. Saying that if they could not put it under contract. Well, we can answer for that at another time. Sure. So let, let's keep this letter, which was Kitty's intent, was to yeah. get them to just answer yes, no, that, you know, taking it off the tax rolls is an option. Okay, okay so we're okay with the, the way I have the language for that. Okay. Okay, so everybody's okay with that? Now Susan's letter. It's the it's revised Kitty. Letter. It's a Kitty Kitty's, Susan letter. It's the, Kitty the dignity. It's, it's, it's a Kitty's intent, Susan's. It's Kitty's intent and Susan's. Well, I don't know. I thought I was being very clear, but being polite. Kitty's saying it's more indignant. You think this is this is more indignant than Kitty's? <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with with, with that. <laughs> Maybe mine's more direct. I. It, it's. <laughs> Fine. Message across, and I wrote down the name of the president. Okay, good. For you. Right here. Yes. Okay, terrific. Okay, so everybody's okay with this? Okay, so that's that. So now we can whip through, I think, the rest of the stuff. Okay. Um, what we have to do next, do you, would you guys like to do the appointment of uh, Rachel Lagaka to the NCB? Did they recommend her? Yes. Okay. The, I mean, I looked at this uh, letter of uh, interest and resume, and it doesn't have a name on it. Yeah, is this the one? Um, yeah, I, can this is probably it. <laughs> yes, because we well, I, said, I, this is cool. no, I, I couldn't find anyone's can, name on it. Can, um, how, can we put this over to the next meeting or no? I, mean, I just want to share. I'm with you, Kevin. We can, it except for... It doesn't have a person's name on it. <laughs> yeah, this okay. was, I, I know it's saying, because you, you sent it to us, but I couldn't find anyone's well, name I didn't, on but it. Well, I did Yeah, I think this is Rachel Lagakis, because she's the one who's been asking over and over and over again. But even the uh, email is... I could that's not. so funny. It's somebody else. I could. Uh -huh. 
Well, I'm pretty sure it's Rachel. She's the one who's been asking over and over again. I think they have a bunch of openings, and I think the village board, I mean, the NCB wanted, said that they wanted a pointer. So, so far, she's the only one who's applied. And, uh, uh, I just, yeah. You want to wait yeah, till next? This is weird. Okay, so we'll wait till next meeting. Yeah, just, yeah, make sure this is her. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I think it is, but oh, we'll wait till next yeah, meeting. Like no okay. Um, um, okay. So next, we have to just appoint. Uh, I mean, we have to approve um, um, two two parade requests. And I know we have to get a town village meeting together to go over parades and the new process. But right now, this is for hospice, which you know the Wendell Harp Memorial 5K. It's gone through the process. It's gotten approved by the police. The um, um, the parade doesn't um, require any traffic control. They made their deposit. So um, I make a motion to approve the hospice 5K. Run. Second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motions are carried. Then there's the Reformed Church, um, Uganda Street Apple Festival. They do close traffic on Uganda Street. Um, they did go through the whole process. I think in the application, um, Lucchese, Officer Lucchese, Detective Lucchese, Sergeant Lucchese, said no police coverage needed. Village DPW will be needed to provide barricades. So um, I think there's no problem with that well, either. Um, so I make a motion to approve the Huguenot Street Apple Festival. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion so carried. Okay. Um, the I make a motion to approve the resolution for consolidated funding for solar. Second, with Kitty's amendment. Actually, okay. it doesn't need to be amended because the village approved it. Okay, fine. Okay. I second that with no amendment, Jean. No amendment. Baby. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion so carried. Now, the next thing I want to do is this is um, what I got from Linda Hannigan and our new uh, bookkeeper who's doing an amazing job under incredibly difficult, difficult circumstances where she thought she'd have five, six months of training and all of a sudden now she's our full-time bookkeeper. Um, but there's so much going on and stuff. So um, Linda Hannigan, um, after a conversation with Arlene, our bookkeeper, and a conversation with myself um, and conversation I had with Jean today, um, hello Susan, due to the quick decision needed regarding the former bookkeeper Bookkeeper's health situation. I understand the new bookkeeper did not get as much training and assistance in learning the job as planned. I would like to propose. Actually, I think I have copies for everybody. Um, I would like to propose that Sedora Company provide accounting assistance and training to the new bookkeeper on an as-needed basis, billable at our standard hourly rate. I would suggest a cap of five thousand dollars, with the understanding that if more time is needed, this cap would be reconsidered. Thank you for considering our firm. So, actually, I had after. The conversation with our lead in a conversation with um, Jean today. I actually called Linda to discuss this and this is based on Jean's recommendation of what she thought we should do and then um, Linda Hadigan saying she would do it at an hourly rate. Uh, I would like to ask the board to uh, approve this because it's just a really unfair I, situation. I, I'm going to I'm gonna move to approve the spending at an hourly rate up to what amount? Well, it's up to 5000 well, We to don't know what the hourly rate is. To Whatever her billable hourly rate is. Yeah. Oh, oh. What, what is what's an hour? up to an hour? $125 an hour? Well, no, I don't know. I, can't, well, I, can't. I don't know what her hourly rate okay, is. Okay, well, whatever her rate is, it's going to be the municipal rate, what we're accustomed <laughs> to being charged. Well, we, if it's we, not, then then we'll, we'll revisit this. But what I want to do is move to approve the appropriation of the money so that this training can occur and it will actually help us moving forward in creating our annual financial documentation and they can assist us in streamlining that process. I think it's money well spent right now. Okay. But you're, you're, so your motion is up to $5,000? Yes. Okay. And I, we do have an hourly rate that she does charge us, and so. Uh, no, I was just verifying that yeah. Kevin wasn't putting like for 100 hours no. only no. or anything like no. that on it. Mm -hmm. I would second that motion to approve up to 5,000. I don't think it'll cost that, oh. in my opinion. Hi. <laughs> Aye. Okay. Aye. All in favor? Okay, great. Thank you. I think Arlene will really appreciate it because 
while she's doing a great job, it, it's an incredible amount of pressure and she does need to have somebody that's making sure she does it right. So this is and a... So everyone knows too, uh, Linda and uh, for any of the meetings I've been at in New York City Association of Town, that's Linda right. is always there getting herself up to date, right. always bumping to Linda there right. and I think Susan has bumped into Linda at the meetings every time she's been. So she well, not only did we bump into Linda, we also made a meeting with Linda last year while, to, while we were there so we could actually meet with her to talk about hiring her to get in and do the annual report and the review and all that. So Everyone knows she is the right person for the right, general right. meeting. That is where right. she makes her money. And what's, yet, what's next, Susan? Okay, so that's terrific. Thank you. Okay, so the only thing that's actually next, um, well, the PBA negotiations, the uh, date is going to be um, reconsidered um, and they'll get back to us. The police commission has to make their appointment and um, by resolution, so hopefully they'll do that on August 8th and then we'll be setting up a meeting. Bill is already working with um, Anthony to try to get a, a, a date that okay. will work for Jeff and for Jean and for myself and for the PBA and then we'll go from there. Okay. So that's that's in motion. And the only other thing is if you guys want to take the few minutes to look at this contract for the school district or we want to just wait and hope that the school district doesn't need to hire extra police. I, I know, you know, in the past I know we did try to do some changes in it and they didn't come to fruition, but that was always under when we had a uh, resource officer. And since we didn't, that isn't an issue mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, I don't know if anyone, you, have you read through it or? I want an opportunity to read through it. Yeah, no, that's how I felt. Well, that's no, why what happened. No well, yeah. this is what happened was when we got we got it yesterday asking us to put it on the agenda, and I said to Carol yesterday, and they said, basically, it's the same as the one last year, and so it shouldn't be a problem. And I said, you know what, that's not good enough anymore, because the one last year and the year before and the year before might be a horrible contract that we want to change, because we don't like this contract, because well, we took the time to study but it. But I will <laughs> say that in this one case, we actually really took this thing apart a couple of years ago. Okay, um, so if you... It was one of the first times times that we actually started saying, actually under Don Weiland, who said, you're not compensating us enough because you're only compensating us for an hourly rate and you're not factoring in overtime and all of the other benefits. Soft so, costs. Um, yeah. yeah. Soft and so. hard, hard dollars are all now included. Uh, in there. Okay. And that's why There's it now says away. plus an additional 9.4% overhead. And a here. Then we, we need, let's, let's, let's table okay. it for next. So, so, uh, so I said, because actually when all is said and done, it's like I said to Carol, I said, we can't do this anymore. I don't, we can't get something the day before and ask to put it on the right. agenda. I agree. This and goes so, on next month. So it goes okay. on next month, and if there should ever be a need for the something and we have to revisit it, we can have a short little town board meeting really quickly to talk about it. And this so, is a, 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 this says under the services provided yeah, this is by the department. It should be. It says the department shall furnish one, and then it's the numeral two uniformed officer. So I would like to know if we're providing one officer or two officers. What's the deal? So everybody read through this, Jeff. I do think it was added. Yeah. Carol didn't know whether to put it on or not because we didn't know if we were going to put it on the agenda. Yeah, but so I think she, right. but be, uh, be, before I review this, just give me the background. What's the purpose? This is at football, football games. Football, and basketball. Okay, well, so we are reimbursing. We are. We are. The, 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 the school, school uses our reimbursing us right. for the rent a cop. And it's in Schedule A. It's Mostly. detailed. Most whatever school events they yes. need. Okay. When they need a cop and stuff. So this is an agreement between the town and the village. You need Schedule A. And an emergency does happen. The provision is in there too that the officer will be pulled from that event Love if we go to. Yes. Okay. So I think there is nothing that we I have a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion so carried.